So I will chair, and this, uh, and I will be also uh, try to be the timekeeper of the uh, various presentations. So we'll see how to turn open science into practice. And there is a pitch also uh, this afternoon to that session is causality as a showcase. So the question we can really start with is, what is open science? There might be different ways of defining it. I like to say it's research done well, but this does not really uh, lead us very far. Um, it's about principles, it's about rights, it's about obligations. It means sh uh, sharing knowledge, but also the tools for that uh, knowledge. It's about uh, timely uh, research, or being early, as early as possible in the process. It's, it's about um, reaching other researchers and reaching also the society. So we're going to collect some experiences, some feedback, and hopefully this will uh, help us identify um, how we can maybe uh, better uh, implement open science in our agencies, in our institutions, uh, back home, back uh, in our offices. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you, um, our moderator, Tony Smith. I will be always very brief when I introduce the, uh, the speakers, I mean, because you can uh, relate to, uh, uh, to, the, to the brochure. I would say, Tony, that you are a seasoned official from EFSA, so to, you have a long experience, uh, but you are from the Department of Partnership and Cooperation at EFSA, and uh, I give you the floor to uh, interact a little bit with our audience here in the room and also uh, remotely. Thank you. Thank you, JF. <coughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, just to yeah, maybe further elucidate that on that, I work in EFSA's uh, communication unit within the Partnership and uh, Engage, uh, Cooperation Department. So um, very happy to be with you here. We are going to start things off with a little icebreaker. Um, so if you can get your apps ready. So those of you here in the room and those of you who are joining online, um, we're going to have a first poll, OK? In this poll, we're asking you why you're here. Why are you here? Why are you interested in open science? Um, the an what are the possible answers? Well, you've used open knowledge of some kind, like data or methodologies or something, um, in your work. That could be scientific work or regulatory work. Um, have, or you might have, second possibility, have you contributed to open science initiatives, i.e., have you taken part in a hackathon, in a challenge, in a citizen science initiative. Or three, you haven't done either of those things, but you might like to one day, or you're just curious and interested about um, the open science topic. So please send us your votes. Please vote, those of you here, those in the, um, who are watching online. Let's see. Um, So a lot of um, curious people, maybe, with um, not so much uh, practical or, let's say, past experience of open science. Good to see that we have some people um, who are here, uh, either in the room or online, with um, some experience of using um, open knowledge. A quarter, of, a quarter of you, that's growing as well. And others who've contributed to... Um, so almost 20%. So, okay. Maybe we can close the vote there. So, um, JF, what do you think? We've got a, a majority of people here <laughs> who are curious. Which is a very good thing. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, a good thing. Th this is why we're here today. And uh, this session maybe also uh, is going to wrap up a little bit what we heard from the three uh, other sessions on... Um, uh, open on one society. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, let's let's hear also maybe after the panel, and that uh, would be interesting also to to hear the the, the feedback from uh, from the audience. Okay, um, I'll just use this as a bit of an opportunity as well to talk about some of the things that EFTA do in this area. So I mean, it's 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 I think it's normal for a lot of organisations like ours, but openness really has been a, a key value at EFTA since we first um, was work founded in, in, the, in 2002, 
um, but it's become more and more um, an important element in, in our values as an organization. We had a, an important initiative in 2014-15 uh, called the Open EFSA Initiative, which really kick-started a whole series of transparency initiatives that we had. Um, so I think we'll, we'll follow that up now with another poll. So we've got another poll. So second one, open science for regulatory science bodies. Why? Why should we do it? The current model which relies on experts and competent bodies is unsus unsustainable. Um, open science offers regulatory science bodies vast opportunities, possibilities for, for sharing knowledge. And it can make regulation, or can it make regulatory science more transparent and trustworthy? All three of these things might be relevant to you, but maybe we want you just to pick out the one that you think is the most important. because that's really um, an important theme throughout this session is there's an open science movement and it's how can we tap into that in regulatory science as well? <coughs> how, can we, how can we bridge towards the regulatory area? Oops, no, nope, that's the wrong one. Back, <laughs> go back. And that is the <laughs> next question, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so more or less, we've got um, two of the options which have been um, the most popular. Open science offers regulatory science bodies vast possibilities for sharing knowledge. It can make regulatory science more transparent and trustworthy. So we got most, um, we got zero on the first one. Okay, so that's good to know. People still are very confident in the current model. That's a... <laughs> A, a resounding uh, vote of confidence. Um, just, um, oh, a couple of people may be less, less confident, but anyway, that's a, it's a small, small part of the sample. Um, so. There's no wrong answer anyway. Yeah, there's no wrong answer. But it's just like forcing a little yeah. bit to a uh, text idea. But it, I think it maybe it shows also that more of a focus on the opportunities rather than, you know, what, you know, what isn't perfect in the world, okay. Um, actually, just as a, a, a kind of example of the, um, uh, uh, of the type of knowledge sharing, we, there's one example at EFSA we, we started in 2019, which was uh, called MammalNet, which um, invited um, nature lovers and outdoor tourists to take photographs of animals. And over the course of a couple of years, they uploaded over 10,000 um, pieces of data into a database which is already starting to feed into um, reports on the movements of animals. So it really helped fill, fill, uh, fill data gaps that we had on the movement of, in particular, um, swine, so wild, um, wild um, uh, oh, what's the name for Chingiale? I can't remember the name for Chingiale anymore. Boar. Uh, boar, wild boar. So wild boar, that tells you how long I've been in Italy. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the next example. Public consultations, it's a traditional form of um, being open about your science, getting feedback, etc. cetera. Um, so why, why do we do it though? To enable stakeholders and interested parties to participate, to help regulatory bodies disco discover new data that they hadn't discovered before and insights to improve the outputs. Or is it to allow um, regulatory bodies to be open about their work? Again, it could be all three. Um, just please choose the one you think is the most important for you. Yeah, again, there is no wrong answer. All are fine, yeah. but... Uh, it's just to get you thinking. Stimulate the gray matter. Yes, and uh, sell your own fish. Whether you are from, you know, regulatory side or citizen side. Or yeah. side. Okay. Maybe we can have a look at the, um, the votes that are coming in. Okay. So, help regulatory bodies discover other data and insights. So, it's a very positive um, response there. Good. Um, again, I'll give you a quick um, few, few stats from EFSA. 
Um, we've really increased the number of pub public consultations we do over the last um, seven or eight years. I think it's gone up from around 25 to 30 in 2015, 26 to um, last year we did over 80. So there's been a kind of really big um, growth. And, and of course, they have a big impact. You know, it takes a lot of time to look at the comments, process them, as colleagues know. Um, <laughs> so it's just an example there. Um, but yeah, it looks like um, people think it's worthwhile. And it is. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we started also working much more with, uh, with agencies also in our unit on open science, and particularly with EFSA, and as I mentioned, also EA. And uh, that's uh, quite exciting. I think it's, uh, there's a lot to, to gain from uh, opening up in general, but with you know, the, 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 right, uh, the right environment and the right safe environment for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get a chance to say earlier, but if you want to, by all means in the chat, um, share some of those experiences that you might ha have had uh, with open science initiatives, either as generators of knowledge or of users of knowledge in, in some form or other. Um, to get a bit of a discussion ongoing. And that goes for the people in the room and for those who are joining us online. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tony. I will ask you uh, to stay here mm -hmm. because we are diving now into the, uh, the first part of, the, um, of this program. Nothing works in isolation. There are risks that are universal. We have open solutions and we have lots of things to discuss with um, our interviewee who is... Um, not with us um, physically, but uh, uh, who is uh, from, um, from Israel. Uh, I'm talking about Shani Evenstein Sigalov. Good afternoon, Shani. We're very happy to have you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, you are an academic who is wearing lots of different hats, uh, but one of them which is very interesting to us is uh, the fact that you serve as the vice chair of the board of trustees of the Wikimedia Foundation, and we would like to discuss with you open science and how it can change regulatory science. So thank you very much, Tony. And uh, Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks very much. Shani, it's, uh, it's great to see you. <laughs> you made it home from Berlin. I made it home. Thank you for having <laughs> me and hi everyone. I hope you're feeling okay as well. Um, Shani, um, oh, oh, before, I, before I kind of miss the opportunity, maybe if we have time at the end, you can give us a quick um, a rendition of something on the harp. <laughs> okay. Without further ado, let's jump into the interview because we're all, um, I think, interested to hear about your experiences, uh, both in your research and both in your role as um, uh, vice chair of the board of trustees at Wikimedia Foundation. So first, first, let's kick off. Um, what are what are some of the benefits of open science um, that maybe we can think about also in in a future regulatory science context as well? Um, so first of all, thank you and hello again, everyone. Because I saw in the icebreaker that many of the people here are not really familiar, but are more interested, maybe it would be uh, right to, to say a few sentences of just framing uh, for the sake of the audience. So first of all, when we talk about open science, this is part of a larger movement uh, of open knowledge that includes all aspects of open, right? From open source and open education, to open culture, open research, open data, et cetera. All of that with the vision to make, and a belief actually, that knowledge should be free and accessible to all people as a basic human right. This is what we work for also in the Wikimedia movement. This is our mission, um, but uh, we're not the only one. We're just part of an, a larger movement. When we narrow the scope to open science, it is worth also to mention that there are multiple definitions and both in literature and actually in practice of what it means uh, to do open science. But usually uh, the, we discuss the transparent and accessible knowledge and that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. We are talking about the process of scientific research, and that includes publication, data, it could be physical samples, and even the software, and how it is disseminated in an accessible way to all levels of society, whether amateurs or professionals. 
we usually include different practices, uh, such as publishing open research, campaigning for open access, encouraging scientists to practice open notebook science, um, broader dissemination and engagement with science, and generally making it easier to just publish, access, and communicate scientific knowledge. There are usually six principles uh, for open science, and that is open methodology, open source, open data, open access, open peer review, and open educational resources. The last one is actually connecting us to UNESCO's um, SDGs, and specifically to SDG number four, dealing with education, and that SDG encourages us to practice open education, sometimes known as open pedagogy or open educational practices, and of course, the creation of open educational resources, or in short, OERs. Now, your question, Tony, that is sort of a framing, and to your question, what is the advantages? Why, why do it? Why is it so important for us to, to open science? Um, I, I would like to discuss three main advantages and maybe give you a short example for each of them. So the first, the first uh, important thing to remember, and I think it came up even as Tony was asking questions, is that open access publications of research reports, including the data, allows for more rigorous peer review, make science more reproducible and more transparent, and make sure that the efforts we're, that different scientists uh, around the world are making are not duplicated. And, you know, uh, being part of the uh, open knowledge movement and specifically the Wikimedia movement that runs Wikipedia um, and, and Wikidata, which is also uh, important in this concept, I can share, for instance, an example from a project called Wikigenome. This is a project that basically empowers scholars and researchers to crowdsource uh, the relationships between genes, protein, drugs, um, and their intersections, right? And it is done on Wikidata. To those of you, I'm, I'm assuming most of the crowd does not know Wikidata, so I'll just say very briefly that this is a knowledge base of structured linked data, sort of big data that is open. It is a Wikipedia a sister project, a younger sister project, and it's allowing us, the moment that we have structure linked data, we can suddenly query it, we can ask questions and get specific answers to questions that we couldn't or it was very difficult to ask before. So the fact that we now have Wikigenomes, uh, it currently hosts genes, protein, etc., uh, and over 120 bacteria. What it does, it means that the scientific world can suddenly have a repository, a free, hand-curated, uh, evidence-based repository where they can go to uh, um, and use it as a base to their scientific work. It's very important because otherwise, you know, every science, every lab, every initiative might duplicate the same thing. So that is one main uh, important example. Uh, the second one is that besides the fact that it's ethically right that publicly funded science will be actually publicly available, it is also important because it, it improves or it magnifies the social impact. And here I can give you an example from uh, wearing my hat as an educator at Tel Aviv University and a researcher since uh, for the past, I would say, 10 years, I've been... Uh, trying to find ways to incorporate open knowledge and open science um, uh, concepts into the academic curriculum. And I've developed different academic four credit courses that um, um, students can take. Uh, and one of them is called Wikimed, which I opened in 2013. And this is a, you know, only an elective course, right? Med students, medical students uh, at the Sackler School of Medicine, can take this course and learn how to contribute to Wikipedia and to Wikidata. And on by doing so, they improve different skills that we want them to have. But uh, the impact from just this one course is actually amazing over time, right? My student wrote around 13% of all medical content in Hebrew. 
And those articles have been viewed over me, really millions of times by the public. So it goes to show that even students who are not necessarily still, they're not yet experts, they will become more experts, right? But they can contribute to the open knowledge and they can bring academic research into Wikipedia so the general public will be able to access it. So it has actual social impact. It's allowing people from all, uh, from all over society to access this information online and offline. And especially when it comes to academic publications that are many times behind uh, what we call a paywall. So the public cannot always access them. So bringing it into Wikipedia and making sure that there are references and everything is really of high quality makes a, a world of different people who actually look for more medical information today online than, than they go to the doctor. The third point, uh, Tony, to your question of why open up science is that it helps us sometimes answer questions that are uniquely complex. And I think, um, there's no better example, right, than COVID. I think when uh, the coronavirus pandemic erupted, um, it was um, it was becoming more and more visible, maybe, why it is important that we have public domain information and in an open way. Scientists have actually worked together and very rapidly so, to share and collaborate on what they found. And it allowed us to progress as, a, as, as humanity. It allowed humanity to progress uh, quicker than if people would have uh, remained with previous scientific uh, practices of taking a long time until you publish and not sharing the results. What happened in the pandemic is that things started to happen very rapidly. People found something, they immediately put it uh, online so other people from the uh, academic community could check, could, uh, could verify, could repeat, could criticize, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, that's how we progressed. In Wikipedia, we actually um, had very specific uh, efforts around coronavirus. And what happened is our volunteers who create the information that you all read on Wikipedia, um, it's important maybe to know that it has become one of the 10 biggest websites in the world. So everyone reads Wikipedia, right? But there was an actual effort of bringing knowledge in real time, uh, which we don't always do in, in encyclopedias. So uh, the Wikimedians and Wikipedians working on that knowledge and putting it into Wikipedia and into Wikidata were actually uh, seeing the information just like as soon as the general public saw it, but had to sift through different um, um, different information to make sure that what they're putting there is reliable, right? Because there has been so much fake news around COVID. So it was a very uh, challenging effort. One of the things that helped is collaborating with the World Health Organization. And again, the idea of networking and connecting efforts between different entities is always a good thing. And that has helped us put more information, reliable information and high quality information into our project. Um, I will pause here to see um, that it has been clear and that you can actually hear me properly. We, we can hear you very well, and it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff. Um, maybe if I could just uh, crystallize it, uh, what you're saying is that um, uh, we can you know, add to the quality of science, uh, the responsiveness, the third part, and then actually the part I like the most as a communicator and a, uh, somebody interested in social science is the magnification of science with society, which I think was a really nice way of putting it. Um, anyway, there's, clearly there's a huge amount of possibilities um, with open science, and it, so it sounds quite seductive, I would say. Um, but are there any, um, you know, what are the, are there some challenges there? You know, why aren't we already doing it? Um, what, what's stopping us from moving in this direction um, more in, let's say, in academia, but also in, in the regulatory science as well? Do we have some, and how could we overcome them, those, those obstacles? 
Yes, there are. First of all, this is not a new concept, right? Uh, there have been open science, open open initiatives for over 20 years, uh, if not more. I think it all started with um, with open source. But uh, I think you're very much right in, in saying the picture is not always just pink, right? It's there are challenges, there are things to overcome. And I think one of the main things that um, everyone who's interested in opening up information, and actually everyone who act, think of your uh, of using Wikipedia, uh, there's always this uh, voice in your head uh, that that keeps badgering you. Is it reliable, right? Is it how how true is what I'm, I'm what I'm reading? And reliability of information is a huge thing to address. It's a huge challenge, and. Uh, that includes uh, the completeness of data, whether or not the data is biased or not, and um, is it of low quality or, or high quality. So how do we make sure that whatever systems we create can actually curate information in such a way that tells us something about where does this information come from? Is it reliable? Uh, is it complete, et cetera? And I would say that uh, just in the way that you see references as one of the main important source to check the quality of information that you find on Wikipedia, in the same way Wikidata, which is becoming very much important in the ecosystem of free knowledge and the knowledge available in general, just uh, for, for, for the audience to understand, when you ask Siri or Alexa questions today, many of the answers they bring you are from the structured data that is found on Wikidata. So it's very, very important that we make sure that the data is accurate. But not only that, we want to know that the data um, is sometimes complete, because if the data is not complete, then how then the picture you see is not complete, etc. So how do you track completeness? How do you track uh, bias, which is you know all over the, the internet and reflects the societies and the history of, of humankind? And so these are difficult questions, right? Uh, in addition to that, there are other potential, other um, challenges. Like uh, there is a fear of potential misuse of data that is put online, or that the public might not understand properly what they are reading, etc. Uh, there is a, uh, in literature, you can find that there is a fear of entrapment, being entrapped by platform capitalism. I will not get a lot into that, but think of Google and Facebook and all the giants online and how they control data and what it means to us. Um, there are also challenges that have to do with confidentiality, with personal information and with how we share information, because we can't share obviously everything. There needs to be in certain places limits to what we can share that don't clash with our right for privacy, our right for our personal information not to be disclosed, etc. And on top of it, there are com commercial aspects, right? Commercial challenges. Um, and uh, in a sense, that's always been uh, one of the challenges that open science has is on the one hand, the, the wish or the desire to open up things, to open up information, on, on the other, the, um, the desire of specific individuals or organizations to profit from uh, the use of their data or their uh, uh, findings. So there's that. And the last one I'll, I'll mention in, in the, this long set of, of challenges is uh, legal, regulatory aspects, and that is uh, connected more to, to uh, the, the whole uh, realm of regulatory science. And when it comes to regulatory science, it's even more complex because today organizations like uh, EFSA and, and others working in that realm need to uh, adhere to specific restrictions that they need to follow in order to make sure, for instance, there is no conflict of interest between the people who are contributing to the people who are benefiting, et cetera. So it's, uh, in general, it's a very complex uh, and not easy um, field. Um, 
I would say that in order to, to, uh, to answer your last bit of the question of how do we tackle this, right? How do we overcome the challenge? May, may I cut you short slightly? Sure. sure. I, I sure. apologize, but we're slightly, we're running short on time. And actually, okay. actually many of those um, obstacles that you've just raised and highlighted will be tackled in the, in the panel discussion after the coffee break. So maybe um, we can, you might also get an opportunity maybe to talk about them at the end of this session in the Q&A. But using this last minute and a half that we have, unfortunately we're almost at the end of our time, um, I was just wondering if you, if you had any ideas about how we can promote a cultural shift so that open science becomes a part of the mainstream. Yes, I'll try to, to sum up um, and say, uh, and probably what I'm going to say is not going to be new to to any of you, right? Uh, it's just uh, the curation of it together may, may be of value to people. So I would say um, that any shift of perspective and approach is never an easy thing, right? It requires a critical mass of efforts convert, converging uh, in a specific time and space and a strong ecosystem that has matured enough for society to take notice. It requires long-term commitments and investment from multiple stakeholders and a very clear vision and commitment um, and to, to network together. Um, and this is at times very tedious to fulfill that vision. Um, and most importantly, I would say it requires a bottom-up and top-down approaches happening simultaneously, which is challenging at times, right? It, it, it requires policymakers, governance, uh, governments and um, other relevant institutions, whether they're cultural, research, education, or academic, to promote values of open science and open research, um, and um, to uh, as part of their vision and goals and mundane day-to-day -day operations. Um, and this is to create not only necessary education for the younger generations on the topic, but also to create space for innovation um, the latter is actually very of, of specific importance, and you will be hearing two lectures later today showcasing examples of creating that space for innovation, both by Leah and by Mark. Um, and these are good, but we also need the bottom-up approaches. And by that, I'm, I mean that we need to celebrate individuals and small-scale projects to promote these concepts. For instance, when you think of Roger's theory of diffusion of innovation, um, it would be usually the individuals and in smaller scale projects that would be the early adopter of any innovation or experiment that is happening. Now, regardless of where you are in that group, promoting open science from a top-down approach or from an open, uh, from a bottom-up perspective, there are four things that everyone needs to, to uh, be conscious of um, whether individual or stakeholder um, in, in this realm. The first is that you have to have perseverance and grit, uh, and that will go a very long way in the face of challenges. And there will be challenges, as we know. Starting small and understanding that change takes time. Remember, this is a long distance run rather than a sprint, so there are no small efforts. Every effort counts. Um, and never lose sight of the big picture. The second is that there needs to be a continued focus and commitment to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we cannot expect to do anything that is truly open by perpetuating historical structures of power. We must be very diligent in including all parts of society in this process. And the third and fourth, be ready to fail and embrace it because failure is part of the process towards success. And finally, when something works, uh, make an effort to really understand what exactly worked. Not only so you can celebrate and empower the people who are actually responsible, but also so you can duplicate this effort and disseminate it on a larger scale. Doing that, I think, by and by, will shift the needle. And thank you all for Great. listening. Th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shani. Some really interesting, um, is interesting ideas coming out of that. And it sounds useful not just for open science, but for all kinds of different ways of looking at life and, and, and the world generally. Well, thanks very much. Um, please stay with us for the rest of the session. We'll have the question, 
Q&A at the end, and we, we hope um, you'll be available to answer questions um, together with the other speakers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Shani. So please, Shani, stay with us also after the, the two uh, keynote speeches, uh, keynote presentations that we're going to have. You had so many good points, um, Shani. I mean, that was music to my ears, in particular when you mentioned uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, those are so very new challenges when you, when you look at, uh, at open science. But um, I would like to invite another multitasking um, academic, Lea Maitre, please, if you uh, can um, join us on the, on the podium. Uh, Lea is uh, from the, so she has many hats uh, too, and she's from the Institute of uh, Global Health in Barcelona. And uh, you are going, Lea, to tell us a few words about uh, what you learned from the Exposome Data Challenge. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for <coughs> this invitation. Um, so actually I'm going to talk about an event we organized uh, last year for the first time, uh, an Exposome Data Challenge. It's a very new way to, uh, for us academics to, uh, to brainstorm about new data analytics uh, method. And um, yeah, I was very happy that actually the EFSA picked that up and as a good showcase for open science and causality. So um, this project was in the framework of the ASLIT project. It's a H2020 founded a European project on the exposome. And uh, it was also founded by the Severo Ochoa um, Certificate of Excellence, which is the funding uh, body that found our exposome hub at uh, IS Global. So Actually, I heard the concept of the exposome being brought up during the conference, but I'm not sure, no, yeah, it wasn't really explained in, uh, in detail. There was no specific uh, conference about it. So let me explain a little bit what we mean by the exposome. So it was first introduced by Chris Wilde from IARC in 2005 uh, as a totality of environmental exposures meaning all, all that are non-genetic factors that a person experiences from conception and onwards. That was a very nice concept that was presented 17 years ago. And it took a while actually for this concept to be implemented in terms of research and collecting data and, um, and having results. The actually took, I think, almost 10 years from the philosophical concept of the exposome to be actually implemented in a European project. And um, in our case, uh, in IS Global, we are mainly environmental epidemiologists, and we implemented it in a mother-child cohort. So we were mainly interested in the early life uh, environmental factors affecting health of mothers and their children. And in uh, this case, we looked at the external exposures so every environmental factor that you may be able to measure at a neighborhood level, such as air quality, deprivation of neighborhood, or uh, green space access, or the built environment, walkability of a neighborhood, which we all know are very important factors for health, but not necessarily all looked at together. And we also integrate in the exposome concept the personal exposome, whatever would be affected by personal behavior, such as physical activity, nutrition, or uh, tobacco smoke exposure. In the exposome concept, we're interested in this external, personal environment, but also how these environmental factors affect the internal levels, the internal molecular signatures, which can be assessed through omics technologies, for example, the microbiome, the gene expression, metabolomics, all things that environment might leave molecular signatures at a molecular level that are not genetic. So we, uh, yeah, so we implemented this concept in different uh, European projects, mother child cohorts. First, the Helix project, which I will present a bit further in detail after, and in the athlete project where we followed the children until adolescence. And when we started this project, uh, it was very, we were very still looking at a classical approach in environmental epidemiology, so looking at single exposure association. And the problem with this kind of studies is that 
you have a selective reporting of association. People will only publish if they found a significant association between uh, environmental factors and uh, health, but then you don't really know how uh, the total of the environment would affect, or if they didn't find any association with the health outcome, that wouldn't be published. So that's a problem. Also, when you're measuring one exposure at a time, you're not correcting for multiple testing, so you have more chance findings. Also, we really know it's important that you need to take into account the confounding by co-exposure. Uh, people who might be exposed to air pollution who might also be exposed to traffic noise, to um, a poorer urban environment, but also be more exposed to lead in the pipes or like th there are co-exposure we know occur together in the same individuals and it's very hard to say to, to promote finding that one exposure is within in a health outcome if you haven't corrected for all these other co-exposures. There is also, there was, because now with the exposome concept it's more implemented, a lack of consideration of mixture effect. That has been more presented in previous sessions, so chemical mixture effect. We are exposed to uh, not only one chemical at a time, but to a, to a cocktail. So in, uh, in summary, the exposome approach calls for a holistic view of effect on environmental exposure on human health. <coughs> This concept really calls for a collaborative open science approach. You can imagine that we have experts, for example, in urban environment, in air pollution, and they never talked with experts in toxic pesticide toxicology or in, um, in be human behavior. So these are very different disciplines that in the exposome project, you have to make them talk to each other. And I like this parable of the blind man and the elephant. Imagine blind men have never seen an elephant and you make them touch different parts of the elephant and they will describe, oh, an elephant is a trump, an elephant is a foot. But it's only if they come together that they would actually have the whole picture of what really an elephant. And you could think of this parable in the exposome sense, um, where you might have uh, data science experts or epidemiologists that have their own view of what's the exposome, how environmental science would be linked to human health. You have statisticians or you may have also uh, system biologists, people that only looked at uh, post-genomic type of data, but they don't really talk to each other. They're very focused on their own research question. For the exposome, you need them to work together towards common solutions. <clears throat> That's how the data challenge ID came up. A data challenge is to promote accelerated innovation. Indeed, a data challenge is usually you leave one to three months to participants to brainstorm on the data set and analyze the data in, this, in, a, in a short time, which actually they would come up with new ideas in a very short time frame. If you think European project lasts five years, you're really shortening that. Uh, it promotes inter interdisciplinary collaboration. Anyone can participate. And also, um, at the time we organized the data challenge last year, it was still very much into um, COVID time, where people really lacked this uh, human uh, contact, where they could co um, had the space for brainstorming. And also, we wanted to create a training material for educational purposes. So at the time, PhD students, okay, maybe they're lucky they're in a laboratory with very rich uh, human data to look at the exposome, but this, this kind of exposome data are so expensive to collect all in, a, in one population that, okay, you're either lucky to be in the right lab with this data or you're not, and then you're never able to actually develop your own method. So the idea was to make a public data set where everyone in the world could, could tr get training upon. So the Exposome Data Challenge, it was created in the framework of the IS Global Exposome Hub. So different uh, departments at IS Global working on climate, um, or more bioinformaticians, statisticians, people working in urban environments. We all came together to create this data set and also in the framework of the ACID project. Um, yeah, I will explain a bit more in detail how, which data we actually use for this uh, challenge. 
So we had a very good response. We didn't really know it was the first time we were organizing these kind of events. And at the time, we could only compare to uh, online events, like online conferences that were organized. But we didn't really know if people would spend time, like more than a month of their work time, to analyze data that are not theirs. And we were very surprised. We received 39 abstracts from uh, universities around the world, but many of them were in North America. And uh, we selected 25 of these abstracts for people to actually work on the data and present the results at the, at the three day long challenge. And awards were attributed. We had a, a pul public vote and a committee vote. So what data did we have for this event? We had the Human Early Life Exposome Project data, so Helix data. This was one of the first uh, funded exposome projects. And uh, at the end of the project in 2017, 18, we had this huge database that we are still working on. It's a very rich database, uh, but there was still a lot of research question unanswered where maybe we thought in our, within our consortium, we didn't really have the tool to answer. Um, so this data, they consist of six mother child cohorts across Europe. So we had a sample size of 1,300 mother and children. And uh, we had data from pregnancy and follow up of the children up to the age of between six and 11 years old, depending on the country. So it's a longitudinal data set from pregnancy to eight year old in average. And the aim was to study the association between multiple exposure molecular signatures, and child health outcomes. Now in the, now in the athlete project, that doesn't work, uh, we have data up to 16 year old. We followed up the children up to adolescence. And what type of exposure did we have? We have more than 100 environmental factors that were measured both during pregnancy and in childhood. We had outdoor exposure, such as air pollution, noise, built environment, but also meteorological variables, which was quite new at this time. Uh, also water quality and indoor air. At, level of, uh, at the level of chemical exposure, we had uh, more than 40 chemicals that we had measurements in blood and urine of the mothers and the children. So we had persistent chemicals, but also uh, endocrine disruptors, uh, pesticides, and at the level of uh, lifestyle, we had information on the uh, smoking of the mother during pregnancy, but also passive smoking in childhood, the diet, uh, physical activity, and also the social and economical capital. Again, in uh, exposome research, we've been criticized for having a very, uh, let's say, molecular view of the environment when we know in, in health, it's so important uh, where, in what kind of uh, social environment and economical uh, capital you had access to. So we actually had good measurement of this through questionnaires. In terms of health outcome, we had uh, six different health outcomes that were measured from birth weight to um, cardiovascular outcome, body mass index, but also uh, for respiratory health, we had asthma data. And um, at the level of neurodevelopment, we had um, the intelligence quotient and the neural behavior. And we had adjustment factors to adjust between the exposure and the health outcomes. In terms of molecular data, we had information on the um, methylation, the epigenetic data in the children, but also gene expression at the genome-wide level. So here we're talking of half a million variables. Um, and we also had uh, metabolic data, so um, metabolite level that were measured in the urine and serum, so lipids, amino acids, and uh, inflammatory proteins. But that's in the nutshell. So you could see here already the challenge for data analysts to combine this uh, half a million omics data. So yeah, that's in summary, we had the exposure uh, outcome in pregnancy exposure variables in pregnancy, health from birth weight at birth to uh, childhood health outcomes, and exposures again measured cross-sectionally in childhood and omics in childhood. In terms of the data, 
some of these exposures or omics are actually very correlated. You can imagine if you live in a highly polluted uh, air area, you're also, it's also an area where you have a lot of uh, traffic noise. And so some of these exposures, even if we measure 100, some of them are very correlated. And it's very hard to disentangle which exposure is more important than another. Um, also, there are some uh, yeah, missing data. We are expecting also nonlinear association. If some of you are toxicologists working with endocrine disruptors, we know it's a, we're not expecting level of chemicals and health outcome to be linear. So how do you model that? Um, so I'm not going to go into detail for each of them, but also, yeah, mainly the high dimension of this data. So we designed the challenge as uh, five different challenges. Um, so previous challenge in healthcare, they usually organize around one research question, a very defined question. In our case, we didn't, we didn't want to, to be so specific because we wanted the method to be useful in different uh, future exposome projects. So we kept it a bit broad and more about the tools than the actual research question. We wanted to leave a bit of freedom for the participant to pick what they were interested in. So the different challenge, they were about how to measure the combined effect of exposure. So not just looking what's the most important exposure for health, but also uh, can you create indices, combine an ex exposure, uh, look at interaction between exposure and the effect on the health. Also, how can you use omics data, mechanistic molecular data, to link exposure, environmental exposure and health? Um, and also how to look at the causal structure in the exposome, which are actually statistically are very particular type of method. And yeah, all of this correcting for different uh, confounder and multicenter design. Actually, in our exposome study, we thought, okay, it's very good. We're going to have uh, six different European countries, so a lot of different type of uh, exposure range, but it's also a challenge at the end when you combine the data because you have six different, very different population. And, um, and you have to take that into account when you look at association and causality. So to show some of the results of the, of the challenge, it's actually very hard to summarize them. So here I just put some slide of the winners uh, to give you a sense of uh, what kind of solution were, were presented. And we were very impressed by the quality of the results. So this was one researcher. Actually, he's an astrophysician by training, so nothing to do with health. And he had a very interesting research question and, and method to look at uh, causality using machine learning, random forest, to determine um, the health effect of exposure looking at sexual dimorphism. So looking at especially what's different between the boys and girls. Another winner, we really liked his method because he managed to combine all the chemical exposome looking at interaction between exposure, building a, a Bayesian index model. And the last winner, we were really impressed also. So um, this was a, a postdoc from Stanford University who combined all the data we provided, all the exposure, the half million omics data, and the health outcomes and managed somehow in a month to do a, a huge mediation analysis. So on the left side, he had all the exposure, in the middle, the omics marker, and on the right side, the, the health outcomes, and looked how some of the omics marker mediates the, um, the effect of multiple exposure on multiple outcomes. Um, so here, it's a, it's a resource uh, page, so I'm not going to go. <laughs> In detail, but I just put the link here so you can find the data set, uh, the data to description. We actually uh, just submitted yesterday the revision for the scientific publication in Environmental International. And all the slides and the videos were made available. And this actually now is a great resource for students and uh, even uh, analysts who want to try some of this method that were presented at the challenge. And it's so, so good visibility for the people who participated in the challenge. Some are statisticians, and maybe in, they want people to use their methods. So it's a good uh, yeah, publicity. So our challenges of the challenge, it was actually very hard to make this data available. These are sensitive participant cohort data. 
that uh, normally courts are not keen to make public. So how we made it, we just tweaked a little bit the data so they could not be uh, identified back to the individual. But we still kept the, the causal structure in our data set. It was also hard to find a balance between having well-defined research question, but keep it uh, large enough so it would be um, generalized, make it general enough for a wider community to use the method. It was also a short time frame, only one month for the participant to, to work on the data. And, um, and also, yeah, a challenge to give appropriate recognition for the people who worked for a month on, on this data. So we made a publication, at least some of the PhD students can be recognized for, for their work on this. And it was a great success. It was a great way to have knowledge transfer, a training tool for students, and it's been already used by fr from engineering schools in France to PhD students across the world. We also had a new collaboration uh, formed, and uh, uh, it really accelerated the rate of uh, scientific discovery, creating new out-of-the-box ideas, new out-of-the-box method to look at this data. Actually, if you think it's 25 teams who work over a month, that's more work that we could put into a European project over five years. And that's it. of the stage. Um, th uh, congratulations on, on the success and also thank you for making something quite complex, easy or sort of easy for me also to, to grasp and to, uh, to understand. So that's also a challenge. Next, I would like to invite, uh, to invite uh, Mark Shadowheim, um, who is a professor at the School of Public Health at the Imperial College in London in the UK. Welcome, Mark. And you're going to... Um, with you, we're going to dive deeper into the exposome analytics. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work um, in this conference. So basically, what I'm going to talk about today is really about an exemplar of how to use open source data, namely the UK Biobank, and how this is uh, an invaluable uh, source of information for uh, research on health. So basically, I'm just going to um, uh, define a bit more in detail what exposome analytics is. So basically, what the overarching aim of doing exposome research is really to identify and investigate the mechanisms that are involved in the quality of aging and that are driving uh, risk of health conditions. So to do this, you, d you deal with three blocks of data. So you've got social factors and exposure, so that's the blue box on, on, on the, the scheme. Then these are related to biology um, through uh, the process of embodiment, meaning that what you've experienced and the exposures you've been subjected to are creating a biological response. And then you've got a response from this embodiment to health outcomes. And you also have that gray, uh, that large uh, arrow that is linking the um, exposures directly to the health outcomes. So that's pretty much what we have to disentangle when we're doing exposome research. So, one stream of analysis is really to relate directly social exposures or exposures to health, and this has been done many, many times. Here I'm just listing a paper that was produced from uh, one of the projects that we were involved in that was looking at social factors and social gradients in health. Then you have, uh, as a second stream, uh, the looking into uh, the embodiment itself and trying to see what is the biological response to social and environmental exposures. So to do this, either you focus on certain pathways of interest, like inflammation or whatever you're interested in, or you can identify scores that are going to summarize what is the biological response to these insults, or you can go full resolution using molecular data where you've got hundreds of thousands of measurements per individual. So that level of granularity exists and needs to be accounted for. Then you've got that third stream of analysis that we're going to focus on a bit more today, which is looking at how biological embodiment, so res biological responses to external insults are related to health outcome. Again, you've got a gradient of, res of resolution that you can think about. So either you'd look at very low resolution um, uh, data, biological factors, so you're interested in a certain hormone or you're in interested in a certain metabolite, and then you just focus on that or you want to look at biological pathways, which is a more general view of it, 
or, and this is what we're going to discuss uh, in the next few slides, you can derive some composite scores that are meant to have an, a more holistic but still low dimensional and interpretable view of the uh, physiology. Or again, you can decide to go f the full resolution and take all possible measurements that you have to try and see whether they're related, and if so, to what extent to health. So, uh, in a nutshell, when you're dealing with uh, exposome research and exposome uh, analytics, you're dealing with two types of culture that, in my world of statistics, is quite opposed, but in our world of exposome, needs to get together. Oh, thanks, now I've got the, the full slide. So, uh, so the, the, um, the idea is, first you have one angle which is really about understanding, so it's more about uh, identifying associations and identify and model the effect of certain risk factors. Doing so, you still have a constraint of interpretability, so you need to make sure that what you find is not like a, a nerdy result that no, no one can make anything about it. So you really need to make sure that you can interpret your results. So usually we do that by inducing sparsity in our, in our modeling and identify a set of sparse and non-redundant signals that are of interest. And of course, the last bit, which is really one of the most important one is to get functional insights. So you've got, you've got some signatures, and you really want to understand what functionally makes them being related to the health outcomes. So to do this, you need to uh, explore the underlying mechanisms via causal modeling and or, um, and or biological interpretation. So basically a result that is biologically uh, relevant has more weight than something that is just uh, not interpretable. And then the second bit that is also extremely important is about predicting. So the idea is that when you have associated features that you are confident about, then they should contribute to understand or predict an outcome of interest. So here what we need to do is to estimate and quantify the uh, added value of a certain set of uh, variables to understand a certain outcome. So basically, these two points are usually opposed in the uh, literature normally about etiology and prediction. In exposome, we're really uh, trying to uh, marry them. So when we're doing exposome research, we're dealing with more specific questions that make the, our task a bit more difficult. So most importantly, we're dealing with complex and subtle effects. So we're dealing with multifactorial outcomes. So it's not one cause, one outcome. So usually more than one exposure are at play to explain the risk of a certain condition. And we're um, also uh, uh, dealing with uh, multivari exposures that tends to co-occur. So that's the mixture effect that uh, Leah was referring to earlier on. And they are not having an acute effect apart from a certain very specific exposure, but we are dealing with lifelong exposures. So to investigate that as best as we can, we need very large data sets because we're going to deal uh, need a lot of statistical power. We need our data sets to be well characterized to generate hypotheses that we could f further test in more uh, detailed data sets. Then we need to validate and understand, as I was saying in the previous slide. So preferably we want to have additional data uh, that are external to the uh, data that we're exploring to validate that what we found was associated with our outcomes is not a fluke of the data, but it's generalizable to as many populations as possible. And we want to infer potential mechanisms, as I said, via either causal modeling or uh, biological uh, interpretation. So to do this, we need deeply phenotypes, so that's typically the type of data that Leah was mentioning, where we have a, lot, a large collection of uh, high-resolution molecular data. And finally, we want to move towards uh, actionable uh, determinants of health, where among the associations, we want to identify the most important one that are adding one upon each other in understanding the outcome of interest. So this is where I'm, I'm going to, uh, why I'm talking to you about UK Biobank, because for those who are not aware, UK Biobank is a very, very large study that has been conducted uh, between 20, 2006 and 2010 in the UK, and that involves half a, half a million uh, volunteers in the UK. And in each of these people, you've got detailed questionnaire data that gives um, information about exposure, medical history, and treatments. We also have uh, well-characterized anthropometric and clinical data that has been acquired during a clinical assessment. 
And then we have mortality outcomes through linkage to death registries. And we also have access, which is a key strength of this type of uh, data sets, to incident pathologies by linkage to um, uh, individual uh, records in NHS and hospital uh, registers. In addition to this, we also have access to biosamples, and these biosamples from the UK Power Bank participants have undergone several uh, screening, including genome-wide scans, where we have uh, uh, millions of SNPs that are available in each of them. And among other uh, biomarkers, we have a, a panel of 30 important biomarkers that we have access to. So in a nutshell, this is how it looks like. So when you're dealing with uh, data sets like uh, the, oh, I have a, doesn't work. So th these are the number of events that you can deal with. So if you look at incident pathologies, you can see that uh, you deal with uh, 50, more than 50,000 ca incident cancer cases and uh, 15,000 uh, CVD cases, which is a huge number that you can derive um, inferences from. So I'm just going to show you uh, some example of uh, analysis that we've done in the biobank, where we were really uh, focusing on trying to measure biological aging in the UK Biobank participants. So we defined a composite score, which I'm going to detail in the next few slides, that was a composite measure, if you want, of aging. Then the second question was whether these scores were relevant to health. So we conducted some survival analysis in the participants, and we wanted to, um, and that's going to be the next step, to try and see where, whether we could define some biological support for potential association we had identified in these analyses. So among the 30 biomarkers that were available in the biobank, we selected a set of 13 of them that were uh, targeting five different physiological systems, so the metabolic system, the cardiovascular system, the inflammatory system, the liver system, and the kidney function. So these are the five main systems we were interested in, and basically the underlying idea is if your systems are solicited through uh, repeated and chronic insults, then that should be reflected, and your level uh, of uh, these uh, systems should be showing this. So you'd be in an at-risk uh, uh, situation because of physiological wear and tear of these systems. So this is how we defined those uh, scores. So we, I'm just not going to go through the details. I couldn't help not having any equation in my transparent in my slide, so here it is. But basically, the idea is that we've got a continuous score that is, um, um, that is uh, between 0 and 1, and that is measuring the physio physiological wear and tear of the different systems for the individuals. And here, we're showing the distribution in the slide A, in the panel A, we're looking at the distribution left for men and right for women of the score by education. So the red bar is for the low education, the, I don't see it from there, I think it's blue, <laughs> is for intermediate, and green uh, is for uh, higher education. And you can clearly see that irrespective of gender and of age, you have a downward gradient uh, of that score, showing that people that have higher education have lower score, i.e. higher risks. And that's unambiguous uh, by age and by gender. Then if you look at the bottom plot, we're looking at the distribution of the score. In, in black, the whole population, and in blue, for the people that would have been diagnosed with the cancer during the study. And you can see a slight shift of that score, a right shift of that score for people that went on to develop cancer after uh, enrollment. So that is suggestive of potential association with mortality, which is what we show here, where here we show in red the, the full score, and in blue, green, purple, and so on, the, each of the scores separately. And we look at the, the association with cancer incidence on the left and CVD incidence on the right. And what you can clearly see here is that there is a contribution of the BHS, so that's the first uh, group of, um, so that's the red bar, uh, in, uh, uh, on cancer and CVD incidence. But what you can see as well, so the different lines are adjusting for different factors. So first, education, second, behaviors, third, uh, BMI, and fifth, medical history. You can clearly see that the effect is kind of gradually decreasing when you adjust, which is suggesting that these factors are explaining some of the association between our score and the incidence. And what's important to realize here is that for cancer, in the fully adjusted model, then the BHS or any of the subscores are not associated anymore, 
while for CVD they remain. So it seems to be the case that our score is predictive or explanatory of CVD incidence beyond those uh, risk factors that we know are already associated. This is another way of showing it. And from the numbers that you can see at, at the bottom of the slides, you could see that the BHS is roughly as predictive as be behavior when it comes to CVD incidence, and that it complements it, meaning that when you put BHS with behavior or with uh, known risk factors, still you've got an increase in the prediction. So the key question about this is whether we can find some biological support for that complementarity in the understanding of the CVD incidence. But before doing this, what we could do with the biobank is to try and assess whether the association that we identified between CVD incidence and our score is causal or not, or is it confounded if you want. So we can use a tool that I'm not going to go into the details of, which is called Mendelian randomization, which uses um, genetic data as an instrument to try and assess whether you have an unbiased and uh, unconfounded association, which is the case here, and this is what we highlight in blue in the table, for CVD incidence. So there's some suggestion of a causal slash uh, unbiased uh, association between our score and CVD incidence. This could be taken for a bit further on uh, by doing more causal mediation analysis. On the left, it's a very, very classical way of looking at it, So we, where you've got all the scores, the CVD incidence and the uh, age and most of the um, confounders and we estimate the different uh, causal and mediated effects. On the right is a more sophisticated approach that gets rid of all the links that we don't think are, or that the model doesn't think they are very interesting. Either way, we find that um, there was a large contribution of the metabolic score and that um, the liver function was not really um, having an effect. So these were consistent and was consistent with the uh, results that we had before. So in a nutshell, we, uh, we found that the uh, BHS was able to capture complementary physiological uh, features that were important and relevant to CVD incidents, and that these were independent of education, although uh, education was uh, obviously related to the BHS level. So the strength and limitation of the use of BHS in that context was that first, the strength, it's a unique resource, the biobank, super large with a, a lot of data, that is of very high quality. Uh, then it enables to look at, uh, with through linkage to uh, uh, a very uh, fine definition of the outcome of interest, but here we kept purposely a very wide definition of CVD, which could further be uh, refined. Now in terms of interpretation, because fine, we have a score, it's associated, we're happy, but what does it mean? So here we took the fact that in, BH, in the UK Biobank, you have some participants that were um, recruited, uh, that were uh, followed up once. So we have a second biosample for these people, and we're able to remeasure the biomarkers on these people. So we looked at them, and we looked at the, the score and the evolution of the score. And so our results are showing that 20% of the people that were reinvited were at uh, elevated risk, at that 25% elevated risk uh, of uh, CVD. So that is telling us that that association is quite strong. Very quickly, um, so we've got this score that is associated, that is complementary. So what we used is a smaller cohort, so the NFBC cohort with omics data, to try and, and understand what this score was meaning at the, the biological level. So we run our score uh, in relation to metabolites that were uh, measured in participants from that cohort. This is the results of the um, metabolites that are associated with our score. And a more intuitive way of looking at the results is to look at this network here, where you can see that each of the subscore are associated with very specific metabolites that are functionally relevant, which is lending plausibility on the fact that our score is actually capturing true uh, physiological uh, disturbances. All right, just to finish, um, we could use this beyond the scope of uh, identifying mechanisms, and what we're also interested in when we're doing public health is to get a better prediction. So we used the biobank first, and that's a paper that we published uh, two years ago in JAMA, where we looked at uh, polygenic risk score of um, CVD again, and we found that uh, it had a very, very marginal uh, contribution to the prediction, with an increase of the cyst statistic of only 2%. 
And we followed up this work uh, by including many more variables to try and see whether we could identify within those molecular and biological variables some that could add to the prediction and, or, uh, and therefore could be useful for uh, prevention. So these are the results that we identified. And we identified 20 variables, 12 variables, that were uh, consistently um, selected and that were actually adding to the prediction uh, performances of the models. And here we can clearly see that beyond those 12 that we identified, not much was, was to be expected from the data that we had. So basically we could complement the, the PRS uh, score with molecular data. Now, just to conclude on open data and open sciences. So resources like the Biobank are very, very uh, rich and are a gold mine. Their main uh, advantage is that they're population based. They are large and well phenotyped, and the true strength of these uh, data sets is that you can link them to uh, registers and get uh, clinical history of your participants. So they are very key resources to, um, defi to uh, define very fine uh, working hypotheses to be further investigated. However, uh, resources are not uh, available globally. So Validation is sometimes hampered by this. You don't have a UK biobank in all the countries in the world. Also, the high resolution data that we need to uh, get more in-depth understanding of the underlying uh, mechanisms are not available in such uh, resources. Although, uh, at least for the case of uh, the biobank, some of them is getting there. For instance, we're going to have in the biobank uh, quite a few uh, proteins measured. All right, uh, in any case, Whatever we do with these data, the causal assessment that we, we need to, uh, to make will remain observational from this data. So you need to be first careful and second, tr try to uh, get as much biological uh, uh, validation as possible. So just to conclude on the FAIR principle so, and open, um, open, open data. So clearly the F is findability and open, resor uh, open resource ah open access resources like the Biobank are definitely easily findable. We've got lots of websites, we've got loads of publication. So that is giving you the um, information you need. In terms of accessibility, then the dictionaries, the data catalogs, and the descriptive are very well documented. The interoperability is also not a problem because you've got loads of code books and harmonization protocols that you can use to make sure that you can combine data. The more problematic issue is reusing the data, because uh, to reuse the data, you need to make sure that uh, all the hypotheses that you've done, uh, made, are publicly available. So I think the open data effort has to be complemented by uh, resources that are ensuring that you have reproducible results, and that includes uh, publishing detailed logs of how you selected your data, how you pre-processed it, how, uh, what are your key summary statistics that you generated to release your scripts so that people can reproduce exactly what you have and to uh, have a, a fully transparent versioning system for your codes, uh, your data, and your results. And so I just list a few resources that should be used for uh, that purpose. With that being said, I thank you for your attention and I would like also to thank the European Commission who has funded most of the project that we've presented. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You can join us on the stage. Um, question, your paper on Elsevier, was it open access? Yes. Good, love that, thank you. And the data underlying the publication was also as much as possible open access? I think it's okay if you talk. Yeah, no, no, if you talk with the microphone, it's... Okay, so yeah, yeah. the um, summary statistics are available. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have some questions from uh, the floor. I mean, the real floor and the virtual floor. We have them in front of us. We'll start with um, a very successful question. And my uh, Croatian, I guess, is super bad. So I guess it's Domagoj for Bosch. Um, question to Lea about um, data challenges. Do you believe the right approach is to throw data out there and let people propose different methods to analyze it or to predefine what you want out of the analysis and then let people find different ways to reach it. Yeah, so can you hear me? We'll have a signal if they can't hear you, so we pretend they okay. hear you. Um, yeah. 
So for this data challenge, we actually it clearly worked to left it a bit open. It wasn't that open. We still wanted people to look at the exposo, multiple exposure with health. Um, what they were quite free on is to see what kind of um, exactly which part of the data they were using. Uh, I think in the next version of the data change, we will be more specific mm -hmm. uh, about how they should use the data, with how they should adjust for uh, for sure for the, for the cohort structure of the data. Uh, but also, we have eco, yes. Yeah, but also leaving it open, we had some good surprises. For example, one of the winner who looked at uh, sexual dimorphism. I think it's Shani, welcome back Shani, but I think it's the, uh, we have the problem with the sound from her laptop. I don't know what to do. Maybe if they, if she uses the mute. Okay. But yeah. then should we not hear? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we also had some surprises, there are some research questions we haven't, hadn't thought of in the Helix project, for example, to look at sexual dimorphism of the exposome effect, so. Yeah, that's... Thank you very much. Um, I will have also a question for Shani, but uh, maybe a, a question to, to both of you and for you also, Mark. Uh, what about representativeness? Uh, you, you talked a lot about the, the samples and the size of the sample, but a uh, question from uh, uh, Jose Cortina Sabrantes. A large sample does not imply a representative one. What are your views? It's uh, absolutely true. I, I agree with you, and, and it's, a, it's one of the strong limitations, for instance, of the UK Biobank, which is no, known to suffer from a healthy volunteer uh, bias, and that is not representative of uh, all components of even the English uh, population. I think the idea, and this, is, this was my, uh, my point in the uh, last slide, I think it's really important to have as many such resources covering as many uh, populations as possible. And what we're after is to identify common determinants of health across populations. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, yeah? Yeah, well, in our case, we, as I said, we had six different countries, so we tried to be representative. We had different ethnicities. At the end, to actually analyze the data and to report it, it's complicated because you start to have small group of people where actually, for example, for a more genetic point of view, it's very hard to combine the data. So we are trying to be um, inclusive in the way we recruit participants, et cetera, but uh, at the end, like uh, when we get peer reviewed in journal, they say, but actually you should have all in one cohort, all right? Uh, it's a bit of, um, of an issue. It's an issue, yeah. Thank you. Um, welcome back, Shani. I would like to um, ask you a question which has disappeared, uh, <laughs> which I liked, which, wa which was, I can't remember from uh, what person, it was about uh, rewarding of, uh, of the effort. Uh, let me see if I see it again. Yes, from Davide Arcella, in the era of open data, how can those who take the effort and pay the cost for the generation of data can be rewarded? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. It wasn't clear to me. In this era of open data, how can those who take, who make the effort and pay for the cost of the generation of data to be used, because we talk about curation, etc., there are costs for uh, openness, how can uh, those who make this data available be rewarded as a reward? Uh, that's a good question and a big question. Um, I cannot talk about everything, but I can tell you a bit about our model in the Wikimedia movement. And our uh, we're a nonprofit organization, right? We um, <clears throat> are based in San Francisco, and um, we have offices with staff, etc. But most of the work done is done by volunteers, but there are still servers to maintain, to hold Wikipedia and Wikidata and all of that. Most of our money comes from donations of the public itself that actually pays to keep on Wikipedia, to keep Wikipedia on, and also from big donors and um, institutions. So I think one is to continue to have that type of model, which is a good model of nonprofit work um, donated and um, 
kind of empowered by the public for the public, which is one thing. Another that we kept hearing, um, you know, Mark just mentioned that his work was uh, financed by um, by the EU and or the, the European Commission is, is um, uh, doing a lot and uh, giving lots of funds. So governments, big councils, big uh, organizations like that have uh, also um, sort of an importance in, in playing a role. And I think, you know, the requirement that uh, exists now for every project from the EU, right, that the, or the European Commission, every grant that they give has to have an open license publications coming with it, which is important, right? Be, without them as policymakers uh, of sorts, making that demand, it's not going to happen. Or so, so this is another way of promoting it. They're making sure that if they give money to a cause, the results, the output has to be open access. Mm -hmm. So these are different models. Um, some of it come from uh, governments. There are also other formats where the private sector might finance um, different initiatives that they have the benefit of, of enjoying some of the, uh, enjoying some of the uh, fruits or outputs of. So they might have, um, they might put money towards that. I hope I answered. If not, let me know and I'll yeah, try no, absolutely. To. I mean, that makes the connection also to other issues, which is also about uh, all the infrastructure that we need to, to practice open science and open research. Yes. And that's, that's not come free. And we see yeah. that also from the European Commission point of view. And we could finance uh, projects like also we had, you know, years ago, open air and such to uh, Géant before. But um, yeah, this takes tax and time and money. And we need to have also member states working, working together. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we have also a question. I'm looking here at the table uh, for Oops, yes, from uh, Fulvio Barizzone for you, Lea. Uh, um, how, but maybe also Mark, how can you ensure that the results you receive are quote unquote real one and not the results of some kind of sophisticated analysis? Yeah, so actually in during the Data Challenge event, we had some discussion with the different teams and we came up with the conclusion that the best is to have triangulation of evidence and in this case, triangulation of method, so having different methods coming up with the same result. Um, also in general, in, in epidemiology, you want to have triangulation of evidence with different types of data. So if you find, I don't know, some exposures associated with a health outcome, you may want to back this up with some mechanistic data coming from human with omics or with toxicological data. So having another source of data that would validate your results. Thank you. Mark, do you have something to add? Because you mentioned also before about you know, large, <coughs> large sets of data. You use UK Biobank. But um, uh, how can you say to those who say, oh, those are not you know, what you're doing? Well, it's limited. Again, uh, as Lea said, the, the key word here is validation. Mm -hmm. And so the validation is twofold. It's technical validation, meaning that you're not finding something because you, you trained a model in such a way that it would find something. So you want to make sure that what you find is really uh, something that does not depend on the way you look at the data. And, and the second angle to validation is uh, validation, looking at other data sets and making sure that what you find is not a fluke or a specific of a certain data set. And if it is, I understand why. Thank you. Uh, Shani, you wanted to add something? Yes, uh, just to highlight maybe an angle of it that uh, hasn't been really touched, but you've heard um, two speakers uh, speak about their open science engagement and both of it included data, working with data. And what I wanted to highlight is the importance of data literacy and how today it's really crucial for us to, in a sense, give or teach the, the new coming generations to be able to work with data properly, to clean data, to, to do data wrangling, what is called in the, in the literature, right? To know how to tell stories with data, how to take meaning out of it. And uh, I think data visualization is a big part of it, uh, an important part, but in any case, the importance of educational institutions in the scheme of things 
in you know making sure that the young generations that are now growing up educational institutions and later on in academia have the, the necessary skills to 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 do open science it doesn't happen miraculously it needs it needs training it needs um people knowing what how to work with data properly i hope that makes sense absolutely shani and that is also very much connected to a recommendation to uh, member states that the Commission did in 2012, and then we revamped that in, in 2018 on access to and, um, and preservation of scientific information, and we pointed out in particular at, um, at skills and knowledge and skills, yes. We just have one minute left, maybe with the very last question, maybe to both of you here, this question from Alessandro Bianconi. Do you think that open results from explosive research could support policy making, like urban planning? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and I think this is also a part of an uh, ongoing project where we have um, a, a duty to, to export and translate our research into uh, the general public. So, uh, for in instance, in Expanse or Longitools, which are two projects I'm involved in, we are, we are producing uh, apps where our results are put in and where individuals can look at what their exposome looks like, where they are uh, in their life, and so on and so forth. So definitely it will help uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the stakeholders. And for, for urban planning and so on, definitely it will identify uh, improvement that needs to be made when, uh, when designing uh, cities. Thank you, Mark. Lea, yes? <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, of course we are making the, we, first we are pushing the boundaries of exposome technology. So we are improving the measurement of urban exposure or ke of chemicals. And as uh, Mark said, in expense, for example, they're planning to make the urban maps available f across all Europe to, f as a public resource. And also we are making, for example, all the human biomonitoring data of chemicals available for risk assessment, working with uh, toxicologists and to, to make real human mixture data using our data. So there is translation here being made towards policy. Excellent. Thank you very much, Leah. I think that will be the, the last word for uh, this, uh, for this uh, session. We are now going to break. Thank you very much, Shani. You are much uh, very much welcome to continue following the, uh, the, se the, the next part uh, after the break. Uh, it is now 3.35 in Brussels, and we're going to make a break of 25 minutes. So wherever you are, please come back in 25 minutes. And for the audience here, we have refreshments in this room. Thank you. And thank you to you, huh? the three of you. Welcome back. Welcome back to the uh, second part of our session. Welcome to uh, the audience here in the room. Welcome to you uh, from the comfort of your home or of your office. So now we're going to um, have something a little bit different. We're going to hear from uh, three different colleagues about the three other sessions, the three other open society sessions. So in five minutes, they will tell us a little bit what, uh, what happened and uh, what they, they took from those, um, from those uh, sessions. So I will uh, first call uh, Max, Max Blank, about, uh, from EFSA, about advancing engagement in an involving food safety ecosystem column opportunities and challenges. So how was it? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it was a good session. Thank you for asking. It was an engagement, an engaging session. I mean, that's uh, what we're also expected to be as it is. It was a very topic of the of the whole session. Um, we briefly, let's say, condensed some of the key messages and came out of the session. Uh, of course, as you can also imagine by reading this title, the idea was to simply start a process of talking about this very issue of advancing this ecosystem approach to collaboration. So it's very much still work in progress. It's uh, something, it is a starting point. It was a starting point for us as EFSA, but it's also a starting point, we hope at least, for all other actors within the ecosystem, or um, at least a point in, in which we can start thinking about this to become a starting point. Um, so the context here is very much based around the concept of uh, complexity. And this is also something that, uh, as we might remember, was mentioned by uh, our executive director, Bernard Url, during his opening speech, that there's a lot of complexity. And this is one of the major challenges that we're all facing. 
Uh, I'm no scientist, so for me, of course, when I listened to the speeches before, everything sounded incredibly complex. But uh, I think that even if you're a scientist or if you're a data expert or if you're a, a policy expert or an engagement officer, everything's getting more and more complex because there, there are more actors, there's more data, there's, uh, there are more topics to discuss, there, there are more and more, more activities we all engage in, there are, it's so much easier to connect with people from all around the world, so automatically it becomes uh, normal that we engage with more and more players. So the idea of this whole ecosystem concept is that one of the only, uh, one of the main ways through which we can address this complexity is to look uh, at the whole ecosystem we're working in. And this ecosystem is basically defined of, of a set of, uh, and you can see the definition here on the screen, of autonomous yet independent actors, right, that r work together to realize a common objective. And these objectives doesn't necessarily need to be the same the whole time, but it can align in certain points in time, right? And therefore, it's very important to look at this as something dynamic. Um, it is uh, our, the, 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 let's say, the ecosystem part that we're looking at, which is the one related to food safety, of course, is very rich. We have a lot of actors, and you know that much better than I do that there are so many, there's such an amount of data, there's such an amount of research institutes and, and policy institutes that all work towards improving food safety or, or let's say ensuring food safety or continue to ensure food safety. But oftentimes we work in isolation, we, we duplicate, we, we, we miss certain aspects that uh, colleagues have produced. So it's very important that we, uh, that we look at, at this from different perspectives. Here's just a brief slide of the esteemed and very interesting speakers we had yesterday. It was a very, very mixed uh, uh, set of speakers that really added a lot of different dimensions to this concept of ecosystem from a policy perspective, a biological ecosystem perspective, partnerships perspective, data perspectives, the perspective of a national authority, and also a knowledge perspective. Uh, we had a very rich panel debate, and this was basically the meat of the whole session where we looked at some uh, possible blockers. If we all agree that we need more collaboration within the ecosystem, why it isn't uh, happening as much as we want it to happen? So we identified a few blockers and tried to also identify a few possible solutions. Uh, what came out of it, and you can see the blockers here, is basically oftentimes we have competing interests, we have differences in size and of, uh, also of cloud of certain organizations, if I may say so. So there's a, a need really to, to, to have a willingness to compromise and to work together. And Basically, the take-home messages that we had from yesterday, and as I said, it's very much work in progress, is that uh, this is one of the only ways to make sense of all this complexity. We need to agree that we need to collaborate, and we also need incentives to collaborate. And the incentives can be, and it was mentioned before, bottom-up and top-down. And this needs to be worked together. So we need all to agree that we want to collaborate, we need to be open to collaborate, but we also need let's say, a, a framework which enables us to collaborate in and also gives the right incentives, be it budgetary incentives or, or also uh, very simple things like that, that your KPIs within an organization also take into account collaboration. And uh, last but not least, we really need to continue this dialogue and we need to be able to, um, to, 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 to see ourselves within this ecosystem, this larger ecosystem of actors, because we, and this is I think a very nice uh, quote from, from the session yesterday, that collaboration must become the new comfort zone. We want, we need to be able to collaborate, but also we have to be willing to collaborate as something normal for us. So this is what came out, and of course I invite you all to be part of this ecosystem journey we're engaging on together. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Max. And indeed, I mean, I, I wrote in red this sentence, collaboration must become the new comfort zone. That's absolutely great. I forgot to say also that, uh, Max, you are, you are from the external engagement uh, team in, uh, in EFSA. Uh, next, uh, Steff Bonswer, from, uh, also from EFSA, but from Research Coordination. And um, tell us about uh, bridging EU research and policy, where there was also one of my colleagues from the Commission, Karen Fabry. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I am happy to report back on maybe the greatest session <laughs> on earth so far, uh, because this afternoon it will be su superseded <laughs> and there's been other good sessions as well. Uh, we spoke in our session about the science policy interface. And we had the pleasure of uh, Bernard opening the, the session, um, making a call for actionable evidence that we need to come out of science to feed into the regulatory science that we do as, as agencies. That was actually the, the theme of our session, where we had the participation of all the EU agencies that work on life science. So it was ECDC, EFSA, it was uh, the European Medicines Agency, ECHA, 
um, and the environmental agency. Um, and uh, we asked for suggestions of what we could do more as agencies together. Mm. And there, obviously, we spoke about the One Health approach um, as the theme of our conference. The second speaker was uh, Kevin Fabri from uh, DGRTD, uh, who is uh, coordinating food research, um, who actually was happy to carry with her a report that just came out from the high-level uh, expert group on food systems transformation, because as we often discuss these days, we need transition for sustainable food systems. And that obviously requires a lot of also uh, research to support that. Um, Bernard, at the end of his speech, and that we discussed further during the uh, different deba panel debates, uh, made a suggestion whether it would not be timely now, actually, to set up a one health structure, interagency structure. And he asked the panel members and the audience to think of how that could look like. So the the conclusions from, from our session were that we feel that cooperation amongst the agencies needs to reach another level. So in the past we've tried, and a lot has been done on HR, on IT cooperation, but we feel it's timely that we speak about cooperation in the area of policy coordination um, and the cooperation on, amongst the agencies. For example, also there was a call, a clear call from one of the speakers that the agency should be actually involved in the programming of the RTD program because they bring uh, can bring the regulatory science perspective to that debate on top of the, of the many other people that need to be involved in the programming. One thing not to be forgotten with research, stimulating research, is that actually it's also building the capacity for the future because by facilitating research we facilitate young researchers to get into research, to remain in research, and they are actually our experts of tomorrow, and they provide the knowledge base. Then we obviously spoke about barriers as well, because being five different agencies on stage, obviously we recognize that we have different mandates. Mandates sometimes complementary in some areas, but also very diverse in other areas. Um, and that often hampers this One Health approach. Uh, not only it's the mandates, we also have regulation to adhere to. There's a lot of vertical legislation for EFSA, for example, and, not, and that often makes for also a rather fragmented approach, unfortunately, due to the legislation. And then, obviously, we recognize that all of us are busy already with the work that is given to us, so it's not easy to step back and actually take the time for the cooperation needed and take the time for the One Health approach. So our recommendations that come out of uh, this morning's workshop is that uh, the agencies obviously are supported, uh, supporting policy. That's why we are set up. But actually, not only we should support the policy makers, we also should support the research projects and um, engage with them. Because obviously, they produce the science that we then need to translate for, uh, for policy. Um, the research programming, I mentioned that, in fact, it would be good also for uh, the agencies to be closer to the programming. And actually, it was interesting that we had a parliament member also in the debate uh, who said uh, it would be important actually also to be involved in the negotiations at council and parliament level uh, about research programming. And then finally, we made a strong recommendation that actually we are committed as agencies to take up the One Health approach and to bring it further. We want to show leadership from our part actually as agencies. And we will set up uh, a cross-agency task force on One Health to discuss these issues of the mandates, to make sure that we are complementary, to be clear with each other who does what and how we, what is needed for the future. Maybe also making recommendations for the new commission, for example, in the future. So we made a commitment there to put in resources, even if that's going to be a challenge, but it is not only that we need to preach it like we do these, year, these days, but we need to action on it. So. That I was happy, that it was a, a good outcome. And then finally, we had still an invitation, which I'm happy to extend to you for the 7th of December, where EFSA will organize the Risk Assessment Research Assembly. And there we will continue a bit of the debate that we started uh, in this research session that we just had this morning. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stefan. I mean, this uh, is very encouraging to hear that we, we have 
we're really going to do more about cooperation and walk the talk. I think we have started, some of us, but institutions, there's such, such a big galaxy. Uh, but um, indeed, it's, it's very encouraging. Thank you for reporting on this, uh, on this session. And next, I would like to invite um, uh, Michel Patel uh, to, um, to tell us about um, um, the session on insight within the science team, the future of, so of social science in risk analysis. And Michel is from the UK Food Standards Agency, and you are in charge of analysis and insight within the, si oh, yeah, within the science team. Thank you very much. Um, so we just heard about the science policy interface, but we were talking yesterday about the evidence public interface. Um, and I wonder if I can get my slide on here, because I can't read it up there, and I haven't brought any notes. And I know you can see it, um, but there's a little tablet here. Otherwise, I'll just have to try. We started with um, some amazing speakers. So we, we had perspectives from UNESCO. We had perspectives from NASA. Uh, from Cambridge University, from an MEP, but really we were all talking about uh, the value and the mandate to bring evidence and the public closer together. Now, whether you come at this from the perspective of democracy, um, particularly in a regulator, whether you come at this from the perspective of uh, risk communication and trying to align the views of public and expert a little bit more equitably, um, we started with uh, something that I think really does need to be repeated, which is that open science isn't an add-on. It is just how science should be. It helps science be better if it is open. We then turned to how actually, in a crisis, we can work together much better to understand how people are going to respond to things. And the, uh, the, the COVID crisis really brought all different disciplines together to look at how behavior was going to impact on it. epidemiology, was going to impact on you know, social and economic outcomes and, and all sorts of different disciplines and a plea to keep the momentum there, particularly around understanding human behavior. Uh, we then, no, nope, can't read it. Uh, oh yeah, we then had some great for, uh, perspective around doing foresight. Now this is something I do in my day job. Um, but understanding from a really broad and participative set of perspectives what might happen in the future. We're working in a complex system with lots of unforeseen consequences. Having broader perspectives might actually uh, help us foresee some of those and discover unknown unknowns. We had an amazing presentation from Mark at, at NASA. Obviously, they are the, the, the ones that started the whole citizen science thing. And again, we at the FSA have been dabbling a little bit with citizen science, but one thing that he said that really blew my mind was that actually citizen science is not an add-on, it is actually now dominating the field of their exploratory science. Most of the new stuff that has been discovered um, in terms of you know, new galaxies and, and new types of aurora has, have been discovered by citizen scientists. And he left us with the perspective that you know, citizens, are not, uh, uh, citizens are smart. If you engage them equitably, they will help you. And that then moves on to the next thing, which is kind of, actually, we, we are very worried at science, as, as scientists and as risk communicators about losing trustworthiness by communicating uncertainty. We, I think, don't give people enough credit for understanding how these things work. And I think we, we, we try and get people to have this brittle, blind faith when actually we could have a much better dialogue around uncertainty and then ensure us against perhaps some very damaging stuff when inevitably the science moves on when we learn more. And that was an interesting perspective um, from, from Cambridge as to how experiments had shown that actually if you express uncertainty clearly, it doesn't damage your trustworthiness. Uh, we then had a fantastic presentation from me around uh, digital social research methods and how that's bringing um, regulator and citizen closer. Um, and then also a really interesting presentation around a, a narrative and the way that we frame things from, um, you know, from, from industry through to academia through to regulator and government around um, the need for new, more sustainable food systems and how we can all work together to start telling that story to people. And then we came into kind of a, a really interesting debate about what does, what does it mean then? How do we do this well? What are the three things that we need to think about? And the, thank you. Um, the first is that we need to be pragmatic. We need to understand and get better at framing the start science that we do in ways that are defensible, that are un easy to understand, that are clear. Um, we need to challenge misinformation 
and be there and be brave enough to have have a voice in the debate because otherwise other people will and you know this is where there's a huge amount of misinformation and disinformation and that's becoming very worrying to scientists for good reason um, and then we sort of finished on a high note and thank you Domagoy for dedicating the session to all the social scientists out there but actually bringing in the social scientists to really help people frame the science in ways that other people can understand, make use of, share, respond to, is crucial. And um, so that means that more and more we're seeing social science becoming a really valuable part of the mix when it comes to, when it comes to doing science and regulators and elsewhere. So the future is bright. <laughs> That's a very nice conclusion. Thank you, Michelle. And can we have a big round of applause for our three <laughs> rapporteurs from the three different sessions? Indeed, uh, open science, open research can be very different and bring different challenges according to, uh, to the scientific discipline. So um, this is closing the, um, the part two of our session. I'm going to the lectern to introduce, last but not least, our third part, uh, which is uh, the panel. So we have, we're going to have about 45 minutes of discussion uh, moderated by uh, Tony. Thank you again, Tony, for doing this. Um, the, this slide that you are seeing projected is um, kind of a nice summary of the uh, four different forces and brains that we have, uh, that we have present today. I'm going to call first um, Leonie Dandler uh, from um, the Risk Communication Department of the German Federal Institute for Risk, uh, for risk Assessment to uh, join the um, uh, the stage. So uh, you will be, um, Leonie, our social scientist. I mean, if we can, you know, make a tag on your, on your role. Uh, then we have um, Thomas Margoni, who is a research professor of um, IP law at the Faculty of Law and Criminology of the Catholic University of uh, Leuven here in Belgium. So thank you, Thomas. You are going to be our legal scientist. It's a bit like a Cluedo game. We even have colors. Um, we have also here uh, Sven Schade, a colleague from the GRC. Um, you are also, that's quite interesting, advisory board member of the European Citizen Science Association, the EXA. And um, so you are then, in, in that case, our uh, EU organization representative. And we have online, unfortunately, uh, not with us, but uh, we welcome Anastasia Nikiforova from, um, from Estonia, from the University of Tartu. Very nice to see you, Anastasia. Very sorry that you had issues. I mean, oh, it, uh, we're very sorry for the, for the problems that, uh, that you had with the ticketing, but um, very, uh, very much uh, welcome um, remotely to this, uh, to this panel. So you are a researcher uh, from the University of Tartu, and you are also, quite interestingly, uh, involved in a task force for um, fair metrics and data quality of the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. And uh, we have on stage also um, Tony now. And um, what I wanted to say also, I forgot to say that the slides that you saw before are going to be available, give uh, the organizers a couple of weeks to post the, the slides on the, um, on, on the website of the, um, of the um, conference. And also that uh, please continue to ask your questions and raise your, your comments by tagging also the, um, the panelists with the, uh, uh, with the at sign. And please continue also to tweet about, um, about this session with the two hashtags that you know. Thank you, Tony, I leave you the floor. This one for that. Oh, no. There it is. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thanks very much for the um, introductions to everybody. Welcome to everybody on the panel. Thanks for joining us. Um, I love this um, uh, having the representatives of the four different uh, spheres. I'm not sure how clear cut they are, but anyway, it's great to have those kinds of different disciplines coming together in the panel. Um, so open science, we've heard some really interesting things about the opportunities, the barriers, and, and some uses, a specific use case. Um, so what, what I'm going to start with uh, for the panel is a question really about um, you know, uh, the trust aspect. Um, so can, can open tr science increase trust in regulatory science, uh, or is there a kind of risk 
that it could lose focus and, and therefore lead to kind of reputational risks as well. Um, I think we had some discussion of that in uh, one of the um, plenary in the in the plenary session, I think, or maybe I heard it yesterday. So I'd like to ask address that first to Anastasia to get you involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so indeed, a very good question, and I will try to be more or less original and unique, and not to repeat what has been already stated on this topic, because as Tony referred, indeed, uh, we have heard uh, some of the points regarding this. So. For me, first of all, the term open, when we speak about the openness, so by the definition refers to um, some extent to transparency, reliability, increased trustworthiness. And moreover, it seems that it for the data owner or the owner of data artifact, because we speak not only about data, but about different research and data related artifacts. Uh, so it forces the owner of these artifacts to pay more attention to the quality and reliability of both uh, actions to be done, processes and end result. And this actually ensures its management and maintenance. It definitely makes the vast majority to think about what if the artifact I'm revealing, data um, or publication or something like that, um, so what I'm sharing with the public uh, is not okay, so not quality enough or something like that. But this question also poses some kind of stress and fear and even resistance to publicly share the artifacts nevertheless contribute to the transition to the openness as, uh, as a philosophy, changing the whole mindset of how the things are done, should be done, uh, and leading as a result to the increased quality and reliability of both actions, processes and results, and in long term, hopefully also uh, the whole science and society. If we speak about the barriers, of course there are many, really many. Uh, the more general ones are rather related to the current mindset, uh, to which I have referred to just a second ago. Uh, and most probably here it will be related also to willingness to be as competitive as possible, becoming a kind of monopolist holding the data or another kind of artifact, and uh, in such a way hitting uh, at some extent uh, the artif artifact uh, he or she is owing, so basically data or something like that. And of course, there are also other barriers such as uh, the different types of literacy, including uh, digital literacy and some more specific forms such as data literacy, referred to by our speaker Shani previously, but also to other types of literacy such as open data literacy and other kinds. Uh, and if we speak about more specific barriers, not to be too general, uh, I would also say that uh, it is related to some restrictions we are typically assigned with uh, when we speak about, um, for instance, funding uh, and uh, some rules assigned to our projects which are funded by different institutions, which in some cases makes it really terribly frightening to people to be 100% sure that sharing of the artifact is really possible and legitimate. So how to remain uh, within the paradigm of openness which we define in the context, for instance, uh, if we speak about a bit more, uh, not so wide uh, topic, but uh, if we speak about fairness and openness uh, in how we deal with, uh, with it in EOSC, in line with as open as possible, but at the same time as closed as necessary, so as it is requested. And sometimes really funding bodies are the source of these fairs, uh, or in some cases real rules assigned, because our willingness to share only the end result being only holder is also a problem and there be increasing our competitiveness and uniqueness and being the only person or body who can provide you with something you're interested in. So not opening it and sharing with uh, people and not uh, staying connected with them uh, in face-to-face -face or semi-face-to-face, -face, uh, but being the only person. So in the case you need this data, you will refer to me and then I will either sell this data or will gain some other kind of benefits or advantages. So uh, not to being too talkative, this would be uh, my vision, my view on this. Uh, thanks very much, Anastasia. And, and my apologies because I forgot to uh, remind uh, the panelists there's a two minute, 30 second time limit on 
on your your responses, so if we can try and keep to that. My apologies, I should have made that um, point clear earlier on. Um, I wanted to, um, having heard the open data, maybe Thomas, can we hear from you about the the kind of more legal perspective on, on trust um, and, and how open science can help trust in the regulatory sphere? Of course. Sphere. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I find it a, a peculiar question. Uh, I wonder how something that is open and therefore uh, verifiable, observable by anyone, uh, something that can be tested, something that can be um, where experiments can be run, something that can be, for example, mined and reproduced and retested, cannot be trustworthy, right? Uh, something, on the other hand, that is closed, that uh, cannot be checked, where you cannot perform tests, where you don't know what data is contained, where you don't know what methods has been employed to, uh, to, to constitute the database, for example, uh, can, on the other hand, be trustworthy. Of course, one doesn't make it better, right? You know, we could have closed uh, uh, artifacts, uh, uh, publications, uh, databases uh, of very high quality, but, uh, uh, and the other way around. Sometimes we have open things that are not so good. <laughs> But that's not the point. The point is that if it is open, we have the tools to ensure in a distributed, democratic, and verifiable way that those qualities are present. And this is essentially trust, right? So to me, uh, this is uh, really the, the only way that we could approach uh, 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 the question, uh, which doesn't mean that in certain situations um, there may not be space for, you know, restriction to elements of openness, but openness should be the default. Because from this point of view, from ethical and also legal consideration, uh, seems to be far su superior. Great, thank you. Um, which, which is in line in a bit with the first, uh, the comment made by Michelle earlier about open, open science should be the default. Um, maybe moving to you, Sven, your, your perspective also given this, um, the kind of comparison made between open and closed, <laughs> closed science. Um, how would you respond to the question on trust? Yes, thanks and uh, good afternoon. Great to be here. Uh, and I was really pleased to hear exactly what before this interface between science policy and society, where it's exactly about trustful relationships in this interface between science, society and policy. And actually operating in exactly that interface, it's, it's really a must for any uh, regulatory science to gather the best possible knowledge to support policy, being it in the anticipation, in the formulation, implementation, or monitoring. Uh, and therefore, I, I definitely sign what uh, Thomas just said, that by default, uh, these kind of regulatory science should be open to be able to be challenged, tested, uh, and create this trustworthy relationship between science, society, and policy making. I think that's, that's extremely important. Uh, myself, coming from the Joint Research Center, where we are actually the European Commission's in-house scientific and knowledge management service, it's very close to our heart to actually engage also citizens in policy making, and citizens' engagement in science and citizen science for policy making. So how can you actually engage and open up your regulatory scientific approach to have people participating uh, to scrutinize the data which is there, to contribute to the knowledge, uh, and also to help in the policy making process. Uh, and there are existing examples around. We heard about this challenge and the barrier of, of culture, which sometimes it's just not possible and people are not ready to open their approaches in this way. But at the same time, we see a very, very good portfolio of, of encouraging examples. Uh, I just mentioned one, which is now an, part of an implementation of the European research era. And there it's looking into existing good projects from member states and trying to scale them up to the European Union level. And at the moment, one of the Euro um, Horizon Europe missions is used for exactly this purpose, to replicate a project on plastic in rivers with school kids and, and actually engage the kids in, in getting more knowledge about the plastic in rivers and monitor this uh, across different member states. So there's really exciting things happening, but we have mm -hmm. to really work on the upscaling and cultural shift, not only with a few champions, but more widely. Great, so uh, I mean, nice to link it to citizen science, scientists. Um, what about society though? 
Leonie, how can we, um, will society trust regulatory science more um, if open science becomes the norm? Um, yeah, I think I will try to um, bring in some empirical data um, on this discussion because we, um, we published a paper um, that very much kind of focuses um, on, on these type of questions. And what we did is we um, did a survey with over a thousand members of the public and um, also um, around 400 stakeholders. And uh, we did also in-depth interviews with um, stakeholders, so CFR stakeholders, German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, so a regulatory agency. And we actually asked them about their perception and how they feel about a greater um, participatory opening, more public engagement in regulatory science. And what we found is that um, there was really um, a, a great general support for a, a greater public engagement, greater opening of regulatory agencies, especially concerning um, citizens and consumers um, who have felt that they should be engaged more but are not so engaged yet. And what we found is that um, support was mainly based on what can be called, and it's been, I think, in the opening, um, it was called like epistemic um, exchange, can be called like kind of a um, instrumental perspective where you do engage with um, citizens um, and other stakeholders um, for instrumental reasons to expand your knowledge. Um, so and that is kind of pretty straightforward, so to say, um, and, and, and great support for that. What we felt where we um, hit a few more challenges is um, when we turn to these other kind of arguments for greater engagement. So if we look, for example, at the, um, at the normative arguments that we, we, we use it or we, we mobilize it for um, democratization purposes, um, then we have to start about thinking about um, you know, things like um, inclusiveness and who, who do we actually reach. Um, and also, and that is I think what the focus of this question is, um, these strategic arguments, so does it actually increase trust um, and things like trust, greater support, reputation of um, organizations. And here also we found um, a few challenges because we found that this um, kind of idea of um, independent, um, neutral, kind of secluded science is still quite dominant and is associated with, um, at least for, for quite a few stakeholders, with also putting trust in these organizations. Um, so that can be a challenge then for, so you have kind of these um, competing requests actually for, for, for regulatory agencies because, you know, the public and um, the public stakeholders, they don't all bring to the table coherent and the same requests on agencies. Um, so, and we also found that actually some um, organizations may even kind of, especially if you're in the regulatory agency setting, um, fear about their own reputation if they get too close to these agencies, especially if you think about um, NGOs. Um, I mean, it depends a bit on how you define open science and what you mean exactly with who, who engages and what, but um, that can be a challenge as, as well. <laughs> so um, I, I said all this because these are the findings we had, <laughs> um, but uh, that's not um, because I want to argue against greater engagement, it's actually the opposite. I'm a huge advocate of it, and especially uh, because we've done, um, you know, uh, engagement uh, methods, we've done consensus conference, and I've been incredibly impressed and like thrilled, really, with um, the motivations the citizens had, with the learning they took from it, and how they really embraced it. Um, so I'm, I'm very much, you know, supporting also what Michelle said, you know you know, really believe in, 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 in their capacity and their ability, but we also need to see some of the challenges, I think, yeah. Good, good to recognize the challenges as well. Um, in, maybe in order to get there, uh, the next question really is about um, the tools and methods that we that are available, maybe now, or could be available in the future, um, to enable, to support, and to sustain in the long-term open science initiatives. Um, you know, so how, how do, can we, and, and I think, I mean, what we're getting at here is how can, um, you know, the, the public authorities, the, um, the, the this, you know, enable those systems and, and make them a reality. And we'll start with you, Leonie. Um, well, then I guess I can immediately refer back yeah. to what I just said. So I think um, there really are a lot of um, tools and methods out there. And I think the important thing is that we use the variety of tools that are out there. And there's not one tool that we can use that kind of fits all purposes and 
I want to link back to what I just said. You really have to think about um, why are you engaging and what you're, what you're aiming for. So if you have this kind of um, instrumental perspective and you, you're doing it really um, for knowledge expansion reason and you really want to try to tap into all the relevant knowledge that is there, um, you know, there's a lot out there, you know, these, um, and I think that's also kind of the, the, the dominant approach in the open science at the moment, you know, hackathons and um, all, all, all these things where you really see, okay, where's the relevant knowledge, get them in a room, really try to have them, you know, work on a problem and extract that knowledge. And that's, um, and it's kind of a bit of a, kind of, um, you know, there's social scientific literature on that and they call it a bit of kind of a productivist uh, mindset and which is perfectly fine if you have a, um, if, if, if you have that goal, you know, it's about knowledge, knowledge extraction and then you have that mindset. If your goal is, and sometimes or often that's also argued for open science, is more of a, um, you know, democratization, for example, um, or a strategic goal um, of, you know, increasing trust. So if you if it's more about increasing trust, um, then you may want to see, okay, where where are actually the controversies? How can we potentially ease controversies? And if you are in a very kind of productivist mo mindset, and there are actually there's also empirical research on that, and um, where they see that um, it's usually very time limited, and there's not so much space to actually open up a controversy or even find a way maybe to find um, to 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 find like joint arguments, um, then if you really want to go to co the controversy to build trust and understand as, a, as an organization, then you probably need other methods. So then your, your hackathon that's really focusing on, on productivists and we, we, we solve the solution, uh, the problem, and we, we don't really have so much time for anything else, then it's probably not your, your right approach. Um, so I think it really yeah. depends on what you want to achieve and um, then choose your methods wisely. Thank you. Um, uh, Sven, from your perspective, you already mentioned some of the examples, uh, and we heard about NASA as well, where it's really ingrained in the whole way they do things now. So um, maybe focusing on the su sustaining it in the long term, you know, how can, because we've got these examples, how can we stay, sustain it and kind of build it into the system? Yes, I think it is one of the important points because indeed we do have a lot of existing good examples mm. and the good uh, champions and we really see what may work and we have good practices, but it's really linking, missing this more structured approach and more structured approach. Um, what we try to do in, in our capacity as a JRC, but together with colleagues from DG Research and DG Environment and the European Environment Agency, so also an agency was involved directly over the course of five years we developed best practices and guidelines how to use citizen science for environmental monitoring. So really trying to address quite a large field and giving advice how this could be done. Um, and we published this two years ago. And this year ago, it was actually the reply from the heads of European environment agencies. And they were actually supporting the approach and the guidance. And they are now publishing a document how agencies can step by step increase their engagement with citizen science activities. And I think this kind of also institutional buy-in, it's really an important step when it really comes that citizen science is recognized also in the strategies of agencies and, and other uh, regular uh, regulators um, really embracing these citizen science approaches. We had similar discussions with national mapping agencies, which work, for example, with OpenStreetMap a lot, or national statistical offices working on the monitoring of the sustainable development goals. So getting this really into the mindset of people and starting this structured approach is really an important uh, element. And I would like to close with, again, uh, the example I find most impressive. It's coming from the Netherlands, from the Dutch National Institute for Health and Environment. And what they are providing is actually a, a platform. It's really a knowledge sharing platform and it started with air quality, where they describe which sensors you can use, which do-it-yourself do methods and so on and so forth. But on that very platform, they also published all their official data. And they were inviting all citizen science projects to upload their data as well, either copying from their premises or even that they act as a data platform for citizen science projects. Um, and they do it, they put this data on board, and they do a quality insurance and a scrutiny as to any other data. But everything is openly available. And if you have a particular purpose, you, want to, you can look at the data set, you can decide which kind of quality criteria fit your purpose, 
and then you download the data and access the data that is fitting your needs, independent where the source actually comes from. And I think for me this is a leading example where an agency, in that case an, a national institute, helps sustaining especially the data management angle, which is always a big challenge. Great, thank you. A very interesting example as well. Um, maybe at this point, what I was thinking of doing is, um, Thomas, coming to you and, and asking, so we've heard about some of these methods and making them long term, but we know there are barriers as well to making this viable. Um, can you, from your more legal perspective as well, talk about those barriers uh, about making open science viable uh, for the scientific assessment process? I think that there is, uh, so that there are two levels here, I, I would say. Um, one is more, the more institutional one. Um, and at that level, we could say that there is certainly an ethical and, and often uh, also a legal uh, obligation for uh, public sector bodies, public agencies, uh, to make uh, uh, the, uh, the output of, of their activities open, right? Um, at the European level, for example, we have the Open Data Directive that obliges public sector bodies to make uh, uh, most of their documents reusable by default. Uh, and that's a very key issue, right? Because the underlying concept, the fact that because you're a public entity, you're funded by public money, therefore the output of your activity should benefit the public is linear logic, right? There shouldn't be a question. Um, and therefore, the same principle, which is already law, is already enshrined into the Open Data Directive, which entered into force a few years ago, which is the last chapter of uh, the development of what we call public sector information. Um, but also in new proposed legislation, such as the Data Governance Act, that try to, tries to push even further this obligation for situations in which uh, um, uh, either personal data or intellectual property rights uh, insist on uh, the data uh, held by uh, public sector bodies, and also the creation of this concept of data altruism. So these are all interventions made with the goal of enabling a wider sharing of data because this is good. So the fact that uh, the, uh, the result, open science, more openness, is uh, a public policy goal um, seems to be already quite clear in the activity of, uh, of the legislature of the European and the many national levels, as we have just, uh, just heard. Um, are there obstacles? Uh, there may be, you know, I think that you are trying to hint me towards, yes, that there is copyright, there are patents, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, to a certain degree, uh, th they are neutral in the sense that uh, they are not external to this conversation. Um, the, the person entitled to the copyright is usually the author. Now, we could check whether there are specific contractual or employment relationships, but 90% of the time is the author. If we give the right incentives to the author, the author will be happy to make that open, especially if we are talking about uh, scientific authors, uh, uh, people working in academia that have already uh, experienced the benefit of public sharing. Um, of course, that doesn't apply everywhere, that there may be authors who prefer to you know, keep it closed. It may happen. There are solutions for that. So we know from, for example, Plan S that there are uh, right retention strategies or uh, secondary publication rights. Uh, and these are all very effective uh, uh, approaches. But the truth is that if we give the right incentives to the researchers or to the, the regulatory bodies, but I think that even more to the researchers uh, to publish their um, results, being publications or data, uh, with open licenses, then this almost works automatically. And the right incentives are, um, you know, when you get assessed, because everyone wants to get a promotion, get tenure, get the grant, then we cannot favor the fact that you're publishing in, uh, you know, high impact factor journals because the impact factor as such is an index that uh, how accurate may it be um, is not really, so that the way in which it is used is often uh, in, uh, used in a way that um, uh, controls 
the incentive type on how publish, uh, sorry, authors publish, right? So that is really the trick. You give a lot of incentives to author to publish in closed access because in that way their career progress faster. And that's really the, the bottleneck that often has to be, to be uh, fixed. So if you want a real uh, um, obstacle, I think that I give you this one. Um, just before going to Anastasia, maybe I can just follow up with you on that, on something that Shani mentioned um, in the first part of the session, which is also the um, guarantee and the impartiality of the contributions. I mean, does that, um, how would that factor in there as well as being a potential barrier in ensuring that there's impartiality, that, um, you know, avoiding conflicts of interest? At, at what level of the chain do you mean? Well, in contributing to open science, which is then used in a regulatory context. Well, I don't really see how open or closed would have an impact uh, really here. Um, I may be missing the, 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 the obvious, but uh, um, often you, know, you hear the argument that uh, you have to justify open science. But as we already pointed out, open science, for all the reasons we mentioned, works better, therefore should be the default, right? So if you're in doubt, if you're not sure if it is gonna work, open, open science probably is gonna work better. Hmm? Unless we can prove that there is a problem, we shouldn't default on the traditional publishing or you know, closed model of distribution because we are experiencing the limit of that on a daily basis we are seeing all the problems connected with not being able to reuse your own data because you transferred the copyright because you didn't know because you had to publish within six months because the grant was expiring, and then you don't own that publication anymore, right? So if I see a problem connected, uh, well, I have to speak of rights, so for, to fundamental rights such as uh, academic freedom, which are protected by the charter of, uh, of, uh, of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, these are the real problems. Hmm? It's the power asymmetry in which authors are often put that obliges them to transfer their copyright. It's not the reuse by who knows who that you do on the results of that research, right? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Anastasia, um, actually, in a way, I think you covered a bit some of the uh, methods and also the barriers in your, in your opening um, intervention. So what I thought I could probably do is jump to the next question with you, which is about um, a governance. What kind of governance do we need to handle open data in support of scientific assessment? Um, do you have a perspective on that as a practitioner of open data? Thank you for the question, and this time I will try to be less talkative. <laughs> uh, so, uh, referring to this question, probably the first or the question number zero should be asked, do you really need a governance? And uh, because it is a very popular question right now, uh, because governance brings both benefits and in some cases some disadvantages because it is uh, either too complex or something like that, because there are um, a lot of different factors uh, affecting uh, the willingness um, uh, an adoption or resistance to uh, follow this uh, guideline. Therefore, my answer to the question I have posed to myself by myself. So yes, we really need the governments, but there are some buts. So first of all, from my perspective and also from perspective of my colleagues from European Open Science Cloud, I would uh, definitely emphasize that these governments should not be very strong, fixed and strict. This is very important because we really need common lines procedures to be followed, life cycle created and uh, really uh, justify why it is needed, how it should be done and so on, but not very strong. Uh, there are several reasons for uh, this, and I will definitely try to cover at least uh, a few of them in um, several seconds or minutes I will have. Uh, but also the point I would like to bring, uh, considering my uh, background and perspective of European Open Science Cloud, is that how do we define governments and governance, because there are different uh, possible definitions of this. And in our EOSC, European Open Science Cloud, we define, we understand governments as a community-driven, which is very important, so community-driven, and a great way of providing reliable, trusted assistance 
and tooling to improve both processes and the result, the end result of uh, activities to be conducted within the uh, research or uh, whatever. Of course, uh, it is not limited to the research only. Uh, and these results should be um, sufficiently transparent and broadly inclusive to achieve as the end result this transparency and consistency of results and to make them comparable in some way. So it means that these garments should be well designed and uh, should be uh, built upon very appropriate standards while also recognizing different uh, differences between different communities, specialisms uh, and disciplines. And this is what we are really uh, experiencing in our EOSC where we gather a lot of people from different uh, specialisms and disciplines because we all have, uh, right, not all, have very different perspectives and visions how the thing should work uh, in terms of data quality and fairness and how the fairness should be measured and so on. Uh, but in some cases, uh, these pr both procedures, tools and methods to be used are very different and our requirements posed to these governments, uh, what we're actually trying to uh, develop our views are really different and it is very difficult to understand how to put these all together and therefore we came uh, to the conclusion, and actually this is uh, this what was also discussed today uh, during the night session of RDI uh, conference, that it is still not very clear. So it is clear that we need governments, but it is not very clear whether it should be very general and even not uh, not only in terms of different specialisms, but also in terms of different continents, because it is uh, pretty the same what I wanted to refer to uh, covering the previous uh, questions. So basically regarding those tools and methods, if we speak about fairness, so findability, accessibility, and durability or reusability of artifacts, uh, if you speak about the tools, these tools differ significantly, and in some cases, uh, these tools are developed by and to for different continents, different countries, because they have different specificities. Of course, probably it is uh, one of the cornerstones and issues why we cannot be uh, one common society right now, uh, but would like to become, but nevertheless. Uh, so, in short, summarizing, governments definitely yes, but how it should be done? Just common lines and common guidelines, but not too strict and fixed. So considering all the differences and needs and requirements imposed by different communities, and also allowing to adapt this, the whole general governance we are developing uh, to be adapted to specific speciality considering their uh, needs and requirements. Thanks very much, Anastasia. So, um, kind of a self-governing model, self-governance model. Uh, Sven, uh, how would you see that and how, how realistic is that when the science needs to be the basis of legislation and measures by authorities? Well, uh, basically, I think we definitely need one, one form or another of data governance. You need it with a single source of data, but the more different sources you have, the more important is, is really a solid governance approach. Um, and I think very important parts in these governance approaches is then the, the quality control, the validation of data, and also being clear about the biases. Uh, but actually, the same rules should apply, again, from a citizen science perspective, for data from citizen scientists, as well as of the traditional data. Because sometimes we see data, especially in biodiversity monitoring, where mm. bird watchers and volunteers provide extremely highly valuable and highly quality data. And if you would have the, those people scrutinizing some traditional data sets, they will have quite an opinion. Um, and I just wanted to mention in this governance discussion, a, a scheme that for us seems to work. We're basically looking at the citizen science uh, and policy angle uh, with three, six different steps. There are three tradi traditional ones. It's data gathering with citizen scientists, uh, academics, and so on then everybody can be involved in the validation and interpretation. So these are the first three steps, which is classical for citizen science. But then for us, the important point is to connect this data to or the knowledge into existing knowledge bases that are used for science for policy. So it's really integrating them to the uh, science processes, uh, policy making processes, providing feedback about political decisions, not only how data was used in science, but also how it influenced the policy. And then once the policy is in place, impact of the policy has to be monitored and you start with data collection. So it's like a, a cycle that we used uh, to describe a little bit what we are doing 
and we went through this uh, with a few examples, including monitoring of invasive alien species. And actually, by surprise, I saw my colleague in the room. Uh, we're working together on that uh, for six years now. Uh, so I think it, it, it's a useful scheme to look into these six steps, how citizen science and policy making can be connected. And it might find maybe an input to uh, develop better governance approaches when it comes for <coughs> citizen science data and policy. Um, so we, we um, would like to keep a little time for, to answer some of the questions from, uh, from the chat, um, but maybe we've got just a quick, you can get a perspective from the two of you, uh, Leonie and, and Thomas, on that final question about governance, if you can just cry, try and make it nice and succinct. Uh, yeah, maybe I also, I, I, I had a bit of a peek, so I maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> I start to address some of the, the issues that are coming up. Um, so I think I would maybe even go wider than saying we need a new governance. We may um, need also, you know, some forms of institutional change. Look at what are the institutions uh, at the moment. So with institutions, I mean kind of taken for granted social structures, cognitive frames we have, and how do they potentially need to change. And I think... Um, going back to what I said earlier, I think we need to uh, potentially rethink what it means to be a scientist and uh, potentially move away from um, perceptions of um, kind of the truth speaking scientist that, you know, is, um, you know, in, in a white coat and um, to be um, blindly trusted by all and, um, and towards a more kind of um, engaging approach. And um, we also need to have um, I think we need to address issues of inclusiveness. Um, so I think um, I, I really liked the presentations earlier. We did see, though, for example, in the um, when when and you, you mentioned it actually when you said which which, which countries were participating, and that it, by and large it was um, from North America. So we also need to think about issues, I think, um, of inclusiveness and who can who will potentially participate um, in, in open science. Um, and I think there's a very interesting comment, and um, uh, I think it was in Nature and Sci Science recently on that. Um, and um, we also need to think about, um, you know, how do we, and um, that was mentioned earlier as well about, um, so they spoke about data literacy, but also I would say broader like science literacy, so how do we get, you know, how do we enable um, as many people as possible to participate and, um, you know, starting in schools and um, help develop science literacy, but also help develop what um, some call like um, critical trust. So um, not fall into the um, trust deficit model, but, um, you know, I, I, I would argue we, we aim for critical trust, which is kind of a a basic confidence in science methods, but still being um, able to raise um, relevant questions that may be also critical sometimes. Great. Thomas. I think that in addition to what has been uh, already said, probably an element that from my perspective uh, will be important uh, is uh, the raising of, uh, of, uh, of an awareness and education among the entire science uh, um, ecosystem, especially researchers, but also research administrators, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, 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 the legal dimension of open science. Um, as you may expect, we all, we, I, my colleagues, we receive always many uh, questions about, uh, you know, the, the, the privacy, the, the, the copyright, the, the licensing, the contract implications. Um, and often these are related to very complex research projects that uh, have been running for two or three years. Maybe there are 15 or maybe 80 partners. And uh, I'd love to offer an answer. I think it's a very interesting thing. I just need a year or maybe a year and a half. I need to formulate a research question, develop certain methods, run my experiments, and help you with the answer. Um, so I think that with this I mean that uh, th there is a need to include uh, the legal dimension in your research design from the beginning. You may like it or not, but it's part of the reality. How do you do that at any level? Or you end up uh, before the end of the program with the usual problems. Oh, I cannot reuse this data because I obtained the, con I obtained the concept on the basis of this specific uh, purpose, but now I realize that I repurpose it. I just thought that I could change it, but now I learned that I cannot change it, right? These are things that once are done are very difficult to undo. 
But if you design them well, and at this point in time we have the knowledge, so it's easy. At the beginning, they flow naturally. Now, I know it might sound like an advertisement, you know, <laughs> invite your uh, lawyer friend uh, <laughs> to your next research project. Um, but to a certain degree, this is the, 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 um, the design shift that, uh, that we need. Um, if you perceive uh, legal issues as being a problem, because I don't, but that's my field, then uh, address them in the most logical way, right? Partner up, put in your consortium a lawyer, but not at the last five minutes with, you know, like a small budget saying, okay, we have done this massive work for the last 10 years, can you <laughs> fix it, please? Because that's impossible at that point in time. But when you design it, then it may be often it is possible. This raising of awareness at uh, different levels, and uh, yeah, that would be, I guess, my main recommendation. Great. Um, identify the problems at the beginning, not at the end, and resolve them. Okay, we've got um, only a couple of minutes um, uh, for some questions, maybe a few more than that. Let's see if we can uh, keep you here just a little longer to answer some of the questions from the chat. Um, let's go for, I can't see the one that came in earlier. I don't know if you can scroll back up, but I'll ask quickly anyway the one from Akos because he's got quite a few ticks there. Um, thumbs up. About the downsides and if there are geopolitical adversarial challenges. Um, well, we, we heard a little bit about not geopolitical, but at least geographical <laughs> issues there. Um, who could I address this one to first? Um, Sven? Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough question towards the end of the panel, huh? because indeed, uh, um, downside of open science, I leave for somebody else. But indeed, open data is discussed already very widely as something which has been pushed also on a political level for, for a long time. Uh, and of course, it needs an investment to publish open data and to curate it and to keep it up. So there is quite an in investment. And there is the remaining question or discussion, what is the return on investment on open data, especially of investment in the EU? What is the benefit for the EU? No? And then maybe I can pass it on to Thomas, I'm not sure. Last five minutes, I need help from a lawyer. <laughs> no, um, but I think <laughs> one of the ground. approaches is then actually also to, to shield this to a degree also with, with regulations that then embeds European values and how you, for example, have to treat personal data in these data sets that then restricts at least the misuse from third parties, which may be uh, from, from other countries, but also from within the EU. So I think especially this question on downside of open data, it's still a big one. Uh, and I still, uh, I don't think I can op answer it more than that for, for this afternoon. Um, do you want to add anything to that or um, should we go to one of the other questions? We, we don't have too much Depends uh, on quick, the time. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, <laughs> maybe just a quick, um, quick comment. I, again, you know, I, I, I don't think I see more downside in open data than in closed data, right? Mm. They may be different, but uh, they, they're not necessarily more, right? Mm. Uh, I think that there is a, almost, a, and I, I might misuse the term, a psychological element there where you say, okay, everyone is staring at me if I've done something wrong. If my method were not perfect, then I will be picked out, right? Um, and I'm sorry for the researcher, but this is for the benefit of science. If you made a mistake, we need to know, right? Okay. I'll try, I'll try to be short, but you I can are. continue. No, no, that was good. <laughs> um, let's, let's go back to, there's a follow-up question on trust. Um, maybe for you, Leonie, um, does the panel think that this, um, so, um, trust of society in regulators and scientists will grow if citizens feel that their interests and what they care for is addressed. Does the panel think that this will have an impact on what is decided to be open science at a particular time? So, yeah, in, in a way we've looked at some of those issues already in, in your, opening, um, your opening intervention. Um, yeah, I think it, me it depends a bit now what, what you mean with open science. So, um, I mean, there's open access, there's open data, but there's also, you know, um, within the open science uh, discussion calls for greater engagement. I think this goes more in this direction where, um, you know, in, do we engage citizens also in like agenda setting and, um, and seeing, looking what, what do, should be addressed in our research or maybe even go 
beyond that, give them epistemic authority and actually really engage them in the process. And I would argue if you do engage them more, uh, um, it, it, it can certainly, especially among citizens, um, in, increase their trust. Um, but yeah, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier that it's there. There's not one coherent demand on, on. So for some, it may you know there are different perceptions of, of what science is and should be. So for some, it it may actually threaten their trust in science. So I think um, yeah, there's not one clear answer to that because it depends a bit on the community you look at. Um, yeah, and does the panel think that this will have an impact on what is decided to be open science? Um, Yes, I mean, we also all have, you know, there are certain interests involved in, in how open science, and science is, is interpreted. And um, I think that is, uh, we see here already, like the interpretation of what open science is, is very diverse. So, um, sure. yeah. Um, there's a, thank you, Leonie. There's another question from uh, Valeria Ercolano, um, which I know we're over, but let's wrap up with that also we c so we can give uh, a last chance for Anastasia to make a contribution. Um, about collecting all the knowledge from different ecosystem partners, so in a specific topic. Uh, the main obstacles could be harmonization of structure and taxonomy, and then the privacy compliance. What could be some strategies to solve these aspects, maybe in particular the structure and taxonomy aspects? Do you think, Anastasia? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Indeed, very interesting and very important to consider and to really deal with because uh, there is no silver bullet right now. But uh, to be very assured, I would say that uh, there are two main answers. Uh, and to be very sure, literacy and governance, because governance w would deal in the best case, in if it is really, um, really governance. It would uh, allow to harmonize data. It would be one of uh, one of um, objectives to be achieved and another one is literacy because uh, by literacy if we refer to how these data are made publicly available so basically if we refer to open data being compliant with open data principles it's supposed by itself that uh, this data will be well uh, documented all the parameters uh, used and attributes uh, within the data set are very well uh, described which contributes significantly uh, to to combination of more than one data set it would also uh, refer to metadata and the quality of metadata of uh, the use of api which would allow us uh, to combine once again and to use uh, straightforward this data by transmitting them uh, to your own application or whatever. So basically, to be very sure, I would say that on the side of uh, the users, it would be literacy, digital literacy, data literacy, and open data literacy, and perhaps other types of literacy. Uh, but to be uh, very uh, compact, so literacy. And uh, on the other end, it is governance, because it would be a part of uh, governance strategies, how to achieve harmonization of uh, data by means of including but not limited fairness. Uh, so those principles uh, making all your artifacts fair. Thank you very much, Anastasia. We're four minutes, 50 seconds over, and I know it's uh, towards the end of the day and people are getting um, maybe uh, a bit sleepy or at least needing to do other things. So I'd like to wrap it up now. Maybe just mentioning to Thomas that there was one more question for you about um, how could IPP protected while requiring industry to open up the data. Maybe you can answer it in the chat later. European Data Spaces is the initiative taken by the Commission okay, to okay. try to achieve that. Okay, so it's already been uh, it's already <laughs> been done. Um, thank you so much to Anastasia, Leoni, Sven, and Thomas. Um, thank you to the questions from the audience, uh, both here in the room and online, and thank you for your attention. And I'd like to hand uh, the session back to uh, Jean-Francois for the closing remarks, the wrap-up. <laughs> Over to you, boss. <laughs> thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's nothing like more exciting than having somebody from the European Commission to close a session. So <laughs> I'll try to be brief with five minutes. I have one slide. Uh, so with um, it's so small, I can't read it. So that's why I have it also here printed for me <laughs> with some hyperlinks. So when the slide is, uh, is available, of course, you will be able to click. I wanted to call it connecting the dots to turn open science into practice because I, I think this is what we have been uh, seeing today and also with the other sessions that have been uh, reported on uh, previously. 
So I completely uh, personally choose five points uh, that I think are somehow connecting uh, those dots. The first one um, is it, very uh, important to me, and I think this is clear. It's about reforming the research assessment systems. And this is not, nothing really new, but the good thing is that things are moving, I hope, in the right direction. I, there's a community of practice that has started in, uh, led by the Commission, and there are hundreds of associations uh, and, and different stakeholders, and it started uh, um, beginning of this year, so trying to, to work together uh, to see what we can do, because it's not easy um, to, uh, to change the way uh, we are assessed as academics, uh, as uh, funders, etc. But what is very interesting from a European point of view is that early this month, uh, 10th of June, 27 member states uh, drew some conclusions uh, on um, research assessment and implementation of open science. Google search for it, if you don't, uh, as now I have access to, to the link. But that shows that you have 27 governments that are ready to work together on those issues. And I think this is super important. The second one, I will be brief because Thomas uh, mentioned it quite a lot. It's about making the EU copyright and data legislative and regulatory framework fit for research. We, as the Commission, are partly to blame. The situation is extremely complex. It's Byzantine, and because we're a big house, and um, but things are moving. So I invite you to have a look also at the uh, uh, working agenda for the period 22-24 of that exercise led by the European Commission called um, the European Research Area Policy Agenda. And uh, there is hope <laughs> to have a situation a little bit clarified. The third point I wanted to mention is um, quite interesting, it's a bit disruptive and uh, a very different role for us as the Commission because you know us as the regulatory uh, legal uh, institution. We are also a funder with the Horizon programs, with Erasmus Plus, etc. So we also uh, fund uh, research activities and we also have researchers themselves like, uh, like Sven. And what we did last year, we started a um, an open access publishing platform. This is not a repository. Think of it as a kind of a super journal. It's called Open Research Europe. So Google search it. And uh, this is a very new role for a funder. We are not the first ones to do that. But also encouraged by the 27 member states, we'll, uh, we're going to make Open Research Europe um, bigger, I hope. And this is a, a solution that is, uh, that is proposed uh, at no cost to, uh, at, for the moment to the beneficiaries of Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. Bringing science closer to citizens and vice versa, citizens closer to science, maybe this is even more challenging, so we, we heard about that. The question can also be, what citizens? Because maybe if you ask um, you know, some citizens in some wealthy countries what should be the agenda for research, maybe they will not come as you know, first things is that you know we need to find you know uh, uh, malaria uh, malaria malaria drugs uh, that without you know side effects or, or cheaper um, uh, drugs for leishmanias for instance. So uh, depends also what kind of citizens you in, you include, and then that leads me to my fifth point that was also touched upon by uh, by Shani which is something which is a little bit new to us in the Commission, but we, we started working on that, which is uh, implementing, so you can say those three words in the order that you want, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Because open science is nice, it's about open S, but it's not that all of us, we are equal when it comes to, to openness, to implementing openness. We don't necessarily have the tools, the money, uh, the infrastructure, and when we, especially us as uh, uh, regulators, think about uh, implementing open science, we have to think also uh, of the difficulty it, uh, it can be for, for some outside the EU, but also inside the EU, sometimes inside also one, the same country. I mean, not all universities are super rich and have also lots of means. So open science is also very difficult to implement and um, that's a new narrative we're going to build and I hope also uh, having new, uh, new activities. And in those hyperlinks, I put some, um, uh, some connections to some documents from the UNESCO, which is quite a leader when it comes to, uh, to equity. And uh, yes, also more uh, rich country-centric uh, <laughs> point of view with the G7 
um, science ministers early uh, this month, also early June, they, uh, they had also a declaration on open science. So all this is adding food for thought to the, the session that we, that we had today. I hope that you have learned a few things. I hope that if you were here, you made also some connections with some uh, colleagues and making also new friends. I would like to thank uh, Tony, who was uh, by my side, um, all the panelists and speakers, and in particular also all the people who are in the back of this room, the organizers and the technicians who made also uh, this, uh, this session going very smoothly and very nicely. So a big round of applause to you guys in the back, uh, to the organizers and to the team, and thank you very much. And uh, have... Uh, Nice continuation of, um, of um, 1 2022, which will continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>